Russell, there's beer cans in the trash in the kitchen. There's beer cans in the trash in the bathroom. There's beer cans in the trash in the basement. What does that say? We're out of beer? Ah. Mm-hmm. Ah. Greetings, dear listeners. Thank you for tuning in. This is the critically acclaimed podcast. Where Whitney is on Ambien, apparently. Uh, uh, where I'm using my public radio voice. Where high culture, no, where highbrow and lowbrow collide. Okay, wake up. Okay, wake sorry. up, everybody. A little, little bit more okay, energy. Yeah, that's... My name is Whitney Seibel. I am a film critic of some note. I contribute, some. I contribute to the <laughs> internet. I belong to critical associations, which means I'm somewhat legit. Yeah. You do your job. I, I, I got to nominate my very first awards show last night, so that oh, was yeah, pretty cool. cool. Yeah, it's super cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, as did I. Mm-hmm. Uh, I. My name is William Bibiani. Uh, I am also a film critic here in the Los Angeles basin. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, and it's. I also do this for a living. Everyone calls me Bibs. Uh, and uh, welcome back to Critically Acclaimed. So uh, every week on Critically Acclaimed, uh, for those of you who might be new, we watch a bad movie, a supposedly bad movie. Which you chose. Which you choose in a poll on the Schmoville Facebook page every every week. Uh, and then we pair it with a good movie to try to find some sort of common ground between the bad and good to sort of make you think about bad movies in a different way. Maybe even think, make you think about good movies in a different way, about how they're all kind of interconnected. And we also review a whole bunch of new releases. This week we're going to be reviewing the new releases The Disaster Artist, The Shape of Water, Princess Sid, Voyeur, and The Mistletoe Inn. Uh, we should perhaps explain uh, well, uh, to some of our newer listeners uh, some of your more hideous habits. Uh, mm, uh, okay. Uh, well, you, you, you became make it sound really you, malevolent. You, you became really addicted to Hallmark Christmas movies a couple of years back. A couple of years ago, I was in a car accident, had to have knee surgery, and mm. I was laid up on my couch basically for the majority of the holiday season. And the only thing that kept my spirits high, or at the very <laughs> least kept them from plummeting dramatically, was the incredibly like just lamely positive wholesome heartwarming big spoonfuls of molasses right into your face just treacle everywhere (laughs) hallmark christmas movies and that year i think i reviewed like five of them a a week on our podcast at the time yeah yeah you 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 consumed a lot of those things i really mainlined a lot of them more than is healthy i would say and uh in uh, an article i just published at crave online actually i rank my top 25 favorites (laughs) uh one of which just came out like this last week Mm. so i'll be talking about why the mistletoe in is like because on that top 25 best hallmark christmas movies I want to make one thing clear: like the twenty-five through six mm. are good for Hallmark movies. <laughs> you're grading on a curve. There, you you go in knowing what you're gonna get. It's like watching a cheesy slasher movie in the '80s. Mm. Only a handful of them are legitimately great films, but a lot of them give you exactly what you want. Mm. You, you want death. You want we- weird, creative murder. Yeah, uh, nudity and sex, of course, and yeah. may- maybe a creepy location or monster. And that's how Hallmark Christmas yeah. movies work. They give you all those things. Mm. Uh, but Hallmark, you know, they give you the same tropes over and over and over again and that's it's christmas it's a time for tradition it's a time for familiarity it's a time for family and regardless of whether you land on the hallmark demographic spectrum there's a lot to appreciate and enjoy about those movies Mm. ironically or unironically but this year i actually saw one that i can enjoy unironically (laughs) uh, which is you get maybe one a year if you're lucky Uh, should we we just segue right into that i mean you just kind of built it up so much sure why not okay the big release this week tell me about the Mistletoe Inn, because the that's the one everybody week. wants to hear about. Here's what you need to know about Hallmark <laughs> Christmas movies. Uh, they're very they're very cookie centric. Uh, there's a lot of cookies. Mm. There's a lot of there's a certain there's certain tropes that are just every Hallmark movie can make a great drinking game. There, like there's uh, a lot of uh, career women moving from the big city back to their hometown, or career men that happens oh, as well. Is it the it, issue? It's typically career women. It's often career women. Right. Occasionally, it is career men. It's, okay. it, it happens enough that it's worth mentioning. The ongoing issue with uh, uh, Hallmark movies is that the worst thing you could ever do or be mm. is into business. 
But, yeah, you, you business is the issue. Like you know, that, you that, do too much business, un- you're missing Christmas. It's always an unspecified business. Like sometimes well, it is. Sometimes it is specified. It's but a generalized business. They don't, don't do a lot of research into how business works. Yeah, and, and there's there's not a lot of shop talk. It, like the the business these people are in is insignificant to the plot. There's one Hallmark Christmas movie. Here's an example mm-hmm. uh, where the idea is: oh, we got so wrapped up in our business over the holidays. All you care about, you're a marketer. You you do marketing. That's okay. your business. And that's all you care about. Even though they need to do a holiday campaign, you don't care about Christmas. You just care about the business of mm. marketing. But the gag that doesn't work is that the whole plot revolves around there's a new Christmas campaign for like a new cell phone, and it's December, and they're just starting to work on it now. No, you'd have it ready by Christmas. You would have you would have so you started can, working on that like at least six months earlier. Unless they're working for like it's a huge campaign and they're working for next Christmas. Yeah, exactly. But like my point is that it's all about business and they know nothing about business. Mm-hmm. Mistletoe Inn, on the other hand, is actually not about that. It actually has okay. a, it's actually a slightly different take on it. So, a, is, is it about a, a city mouse going back to the country? It is not. Okay. Right? How cool is this? This that, is that's, weird. You're surprising me. I'm Left blowing right your here. mind, right? You really <laughs> want to see this movie. So, this is really thinking outside the box. So, uh, The Mistletoe Inn stars one of Hallmark's many uh, queens of Christmas. Uh, let me guess. Mm. Lacey Chabert. Not that one. Ah, uh, Alicia Witt. Yes! Yeah, it is Alicia Witt. Alicia Witt. Okay, right. now here's the deal. <laughs> there's there's various different Queens of Christmas at Hallmark, and they're all in like at least one movie a year at this point. Mm. So there's Candace Cameron Bure from Full House. She tends to be in the most milk toast movies. There's Lacey Chabert, and she tends to be in the movies that are basically ripping off like another more popular Hollywood movie. Like mm. she'll be in The Family Man, but it's Lacey Chabert right, right. movie. There's Danica has, has there... McKellar, who oh, often falls in love with princes, as near as I can tell. Ha- has there ever been a a Christmas plot where Lacey Chabert like relives Christmas over and over again like Groundhog Day? Uh, that has been done a couple of times on Hallmark but I don't think Lacey Chabert specifically has done oh, okay. it. okay. That's been done before. As soon as Lacey Chabert gets there I'm going to watch that Alicia one. Witt once did a remake of Liar Liar. Oh, there well, I'm not ready for like, Christmas. <laughs> she uh, cannot lie. Which is actually pretty good. Uh, Alicia Witt is I think she's actually in many ways the most talented of all the actors who does a lot of these things. She mm-hmm. brings a lot of uh, a, a lot of charisma, a lot of cheer, and it doesn't feel false. She brings mm-hmm. she brings lame material up a notch and if the material is good <laughs> she makes it great so the mistletoe inn stars alicia witt as a small town uh woman who dreams of being a novelist okay and she's what, what sort of novelist she wants to be a christmas romance novelist which is an actual <laughs> thing i want to make this abundantly clear that's an actual thing that's a genre where people romance santa i think chuck tingle wrote a couple of those well no no because because christmas romance novels they're actually like the basis for a lot of hallmark movies it's a pretty oh, big yeah, market I guess so uh and indeed this is based on a novel <laughs> So she she wants to be a novelist. Her boyfriend also wanted to be a novelist, but at the mm. beginning he breaks up with her because he doesn't think she's taking it seriously. Uh, who, she's never shown her work to anybody, for is, example. Is the boyfriend anybody notable? Or is it no, just like, he's just a hand, dillweed. Handsome Mc... No, he's not. Canadian no, he, hunk. he's the shitty guy. He's the okay. guy she doesn't end up with. Like immediately, you can tell because he's a jerk. <laughs> All right, so she decides. Well, okay, I'm going to use this as a motivation. I'm going to go to this writers conference at a place called the Mistletoe Inn, and the whole thing is it's about it's a writers conference for romance mm. novelists, and that's a real thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So she goes there. Wouldn't and be, it, wouldn't be a, the, it wouldn't be at the Mistletoe Inn. It would be like at the, the DFW Marriott, but yeah. Well, yeah, but the, this is cozy. It's not. Oh. It's all covered in, in snow and stuff. It looks like a, It actually looks a lot like the main hotel if you've ever been to Salt Lake City. Not Salt Lake City. Uh, if you've ever been to um, uh, Sundance. It was oh, like right. I actually thought they filmed it at Sundance for a while. It looks so much <laughs> like that hotel. It was really, really weird. Uh, so there she runs into a a very attractive, very charming fellow struggling writer played by David Alpe. David Alpe was, of course, in Ice Sculpture Christmas, which is also pretty good. Okay. Now he's Canadian, isn't he? He's probably Canadian. The, the, I, don't know. I, I keep bringing that up because these are all shot in Canada. There was one uh, I, I, after I published my list, someone posted a, a tweet to me. They were watching the one with uh, Once Upon a Holiday, which is a <laughs> remake of Roman Holiday, oh, but no. with Brianna Evigan from Step Up to the Street, well, okay. as the runaway as the princess. princess. All right. And the gag I actually like in that one is that the guy she ends up with, like running around town. He's not a reporter who knows she's a princess. He thinks she's a crazy vagrant who's delusional. Okay. And that actually adds, like, another kind of fun vibe to it. That one's actually not bad. Oh, that is what Roman Holiday was missing, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But yeah, they're all they're all shot. They're almost all shot in Canada. Mm-hmm. And apparently, there's this one shot like of like the New York City streets that's like right in front of it. You can see a big sign like the Nova Scotia Bank <laughs> in New York. Yeah, like that's someone sent me a screen cap, and that was great. I, I always say like if 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 you are drinking non alcoholic drinks while uh, while watching these Hallmark movies, take a shot every time somebody says "sorry" or a boot. That's a good one. Yeah. Anytime you can tell the snow is fake. Mm-hmm. Anytime they. Okay, you take one drink anytime there's like a baking cookies montage, and you uh, take two drinks, or sorry, you finish your drink uh, if people end up with flour all over their face for no reason. Even if like it's not a recipe that has a, a lot of flour. Well, even so, like if, you, if you bake cookies, cookies do, you, yeah. you, you don't like chuck flour everywhere. Like this is a thing that like every Hallmark movie thinks is that if you bake cookies, you're going to end up covered in flour because <laughs> wacky shenanigans. Hey, flour's kind of messy. You need to hand, kind of. handle it with a deft hand. Yeah, but you're not going to end up looking like a ghost from an early production of A Christmas Carol. <laughs> like you're gonna... Maybe that's what they're going for. <laughs> Everybody's Marley. <laughs> she goes to the mistletoe. <laughs> She runs into this guy. He's super fucking charming. And it's just them flirting for Mm. like an hour and a half. And what's cool about it is, A, they have really great chemistry. Mm. And B, he actually, he's he's been in the industry for a bit. Like, he published a book and then he lost his mojo and he's trying to get it back again. He has, like, really good writer's advice. Like, if I was watching this with my wife, Michelle, who's also a writer, we're watching it and we're just kind of like... This is actually kind of inspiring and a kind of understanding about the creative artistic process. Mm. And he, there's this whole speech he has about like the difference between good agents and bad agents, and he does it with like role playing with snowmen. And yeah, that's strictly <laughs> he makes it work. David Alpe is actually like really talented. It's cute. It's a very if like it's one of the only Hallmark Christmas movies that if it had come out outside of Hallmark Christmas, mm. I would recommend it. Like it just be like because okay, right. you know like when you're watching like you watch a movie and you watch it in a theater and you go like well this sucks but if you watched it like as a sci-fi channel original movie yeah, you'd say it was yeah, pretty yeah. good because your expectations are different. It's like a, a friend of ours pointed out that the movie Stonewall would have worked so much better if it were an episode of Quantum Leap. Oh God, yeah. yes, <laughs> he's a hundred percent right. That's uh, a bit of an exaggeration. Dear, in this dear case, listeners, but... go seek out Stonewall, oh, Roland Emmerich's Stonewall. One of the worst. It's so bad. One of like, the worst. It's, it's quote unquote serious dramas of the last it's ten years. Spectacular. Spectacularly irresponsible. Yeah, and it only makes sense. Like, the only thing about it makes sense is if the protagonist was the latest person Scott Bakula leaped into in Quantum Leap. Like, yeah, like the only way the movie makes any sense it, whatsoever. It, it is his goal to start the Stonewall riots, <laughs> and he, he won't be able to leap until he does that. Turns out there was an actual comic book about uh, Scott Bakula's character from Quantum Leap going mm-hmm. to the Stonewall riots, but he went and fell into a photographer. Okay. Yeah, so... It's been done. Well, did he ever leap into the same timeline? Like, he's just. I'm not sure. That would be kind of cool, actually. Like, cause, cause quantum, quantum, quantum Leap, surprisingly, is a big hole in my TV education. I, I, I've I, seen, I, like, a third of an episode. I've seen I think quite I saw a bit one of it. episode once on the Sci Fi channel. I, I've seen a lot of episodes. I never, like, binged it or anything. If you don't remember Quantum Leap, I don't know why Quantum Leap hasn't been rebooted. You'd think it would have been by now. Um, I'm sure somebody's been trying. It was a big deal in the 80s and I think early 90s, but the, the whole gag was Scott Bakula was in the future, there was a time travel experiment, and he ended up leaping inside the body of someone in the past, and in order to move on from that body, he had to like correct something in history mm. and make sure that they did something important that they were supposed to do. Um... And that's the gag. Mm-hmm. But I never saw an episode. And someone tell me if there's there's an actual episode about this where he leapt back into the same timeline and had to do something while another Scott Bakula in that same in a different body was also had something to do. Oh, that would actually really be kind of yeah, cool. Yeah. I would actually like to see that. That's mm-hmm. a fun little gag. So when well, they it, reboot it, they should do that. It would be a good in joke for the fans though, because you would have had to, had to have seen the previous episode to get the drama. Uh, that would help. I mean, mm. you, yeah, basically that would. Mm. Yeah, okay, fair enough. <laughs> It'd be cool if you did it like one right after the other. Like it's a two part episode. Oh, there you go. There you go. Um, so anyway, listen. Uh, the mistletoe in is adorbs, and if you have any affection for the hallmark uh, uh, sort of oeuvre, uh, take a drink. Uh, it's 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 damn good. It's well written. It's mm. well acted. It's uh, it's effective. It's romantic, and it actually understands how writing works. Okay, that's really right. cool. That's a really rare and special thing, and I think it deserves a <laughs> shout out. It deserves a shout out. And right. So there you go. That's that's what. If you want to hear more about other Hallmark Christmas movies that would be worth your time, mm. go to CraveOnline.com right now. There's a. It should probably be on the homepage still. Of uh, uh, it's my top twenty-five Hallmark Christmas movies. Again, the top five, highly recommended. Regardless, the rest of them, if you like those five, uh, check them out. 
Uh, there is a Hallmark app. There is. Uh, that you can get in your TV or your phone. Yeah. And I think you have pretty much a bottomless access to almost all of these movies. Like, they, they just throw them in a catalog somewhere. So you I can probably go back at least six years and see all of the Christmas movies. And they come out with, like, 50 of these a year. They don't so, come out with 50, yeah. but it's a lot. They come up with, with, like, a couple it's of dozen. It's an exaggeration, everybody. but They yeah. come up with, like, at least, like, 10 or 20 every mm-hmm. year. And it is interesting because, like, from, like, November to December, they are one of the most watched networks on television. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of that is from, like, the sort of conservative sort of demographic. But mm-hmm. I know a lot of people who don't fit into that demographic who really enjoy the, the, the innocent naivete mm-hmm. of these movies or enjoy watching them ironically. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, I still I don't know why they don't have a twenty like a twenty four seven all year round Hall, Hallmark Christmas channel. Yeah, like I would it. watch that. That would be a great thing. You have a shitty it's, day, you just want to watch some. It's late March. I want to watch a Christmas movie. I think that's a thing. Honestly, I, I, we, Christmas starts earlier Maybe. and earlier every year. Anyway, why not? There are year round. They're they're rare, but there are year round Christmas stores like around this country. Uh, you go to Solvang, California. There's a Yule House, and they sell Christmas ornaments and Christmas decorations. Yeah. 365. Well, you got to realize that, like, like we said with that marketing thing, you mm. know, for every – most people only worry about Christmas in December or maybe November or maybe if you're really pushing it in October a little bit. No. No. But here's the thing. There's a lot of people who need to prepare for Christmas in those seasons. A lot mm. of people who do, like, arts and crafts or decorating, mm. they need to have all those preparations well in advance. A lot of people like make uh, uh, Hallmark movies, make Christmas movies. They need to have access to these things all the time. We had on our previous podcast uh, the director of one of these Hallmark Christmas That's movies. That's right, on. we did. And one of my questions was, do they just have the same decorations in like a closet in Hallmark, and everyone has to reuse them? Because <laughs> I see the same garland over and over mm. again. Um, I try to remember what his, I don't remember what his answer was. I think his answer was no. But um, anyway, I, I, he, I think his answer was they all go to like the same stores. Yeah, but they, yeah, there's no there's not like a prop closet. All right, well, let's get to something people actually. Or like excited to see. I may have seen. Let's talk about uh, The Disaster Artist. Okay. Uh, The Disaster Artist, uh, written, directed, and starring uh, James Franco. Uh, Franco did not write it. Oh, he did not write it? No, he did not. It was written by, I'll look it up to be Uh, uh, It was, But it was based on a book by uh, Greg Sestero, who was an actor from the film The Room, the uh, 2003 cult hit that... uh, here in Los Angeles, had a billboard up for I think a, two years. It was up for a long, long time. It was this mysterious it was on, billboard. Uh, Olympic and Robertson, I think. Uh, something like that. Now the thing is, it was Olympic and La Cienega. There was this big billboard. If, and you, if you're not from LA, there are billboards everywhere in LA, and I understand that's not. They, there are more here than in most other places. Like I've had people come in from mm. out of town. Like you guys have a lot of billboards. Yeah, it's 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 a blight. There are people fighting it. And the thing with the billboards is that you know anyone can pay for it. Mm. Most people don't because <laughs> yeah. it's expensive and it's not worth it. But like you know, uh, uh, Angeline mm. has famously had a billboard up on. Uh, is it Sunset? It's I on think? Sunset. Yeah, which is just prime real estate, and she's had that up for forever. And it's just letting you know she exists. <laughs> That's the majority of it. She's not selling anything. She's, she's just, look at me. She's selling the fact that she wants to be Angeline. And you know what? She succeeded. Everyone everyone acknowledges Angeline her great. existence. Every once in a while, you uh, see her, like, her pink Corvette, like, driving on the on yeah. the freeway. And you're just like, yeah, it's Angeline. Uh, I've, I've had, like, maybe two Angeline sightings in my life. It's, it's so it's sad. It's but so the room billboard was this weird thing. Well, like, no one knew what the fuck it was. Because it was just this weird guy's weird, <clears throat> strange, intense, Peter Lorre-ish face. His, and yeah, it said the room. And it, his for, something was happening with his eye, like one of his eyes is like bigger than the other. Or it was and twitching it, or something. Yeah, it, lo- it looks really or... strange. So nobody knew what this thing, the, the room was. It was playing at the Sunset Five on Sunset Boulevard, and slowly over the years, thanks to this billboard, people started going just out of curiosity. What the hell is this thing? And as it turns out, it's this really, really lame <laughs> Eugene O'Neill type drama about a guy whose relationship is falling apart because she's cheating on him. and With his best friend. With, with his best and friend, and it's just misery after misery. It's about how the friendship falls apart, and it ends with a suicide. That's not a spoiler. That's one of the most famous things yeah. about it. It is and one of the, the, of all the bad movies, and there's a lot of bad movies out there. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, it's it's noteworthy, I think, for 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 two things. There's so many decisions in it that just make no sense mm, whatsoever. Yeah, like but- there's a scene where he records someone with an audio recorder, and then when they play it back, they're playing back something different. Like it's that it's, it's, yeah something out of a David Lynch movie. Like yeah, nothing about it makes sense. Uh, but the, it's the, all- the dialogue is really bad. It's yeah. really badly written. It's in- really badly delivered. None of the yeah. actor like I think maybe the female lead has a pretty good performance. Like she's yeah. the only one who comes out okay. Like but, some of them clearly have some chops, but, but they're not really using them right the now. The mastermind behind all of this, the star, the writer, the director, the financier, the caterer of all of this was mm. Tommy Wiseau, and Tommy Wiseau is an enigmatic person. He, uh, we don't know where he comes from. We, we don't, don't know. We how, don't know how old he is, and we don't know how he made his millions. And, and he, he does millions, indeed have millions of he has dollars. Millions and millions of dollars. Nobody knows how he earned it, where it came from. The juiciest rumor I heard was that he was a Chechenian gun runner. I had heard <laughs> that he was involved in black market coat sales. Uh, like, I'll take that too. Why not? <laughs> there was illegal coats, and he would buy the Tommy Wiseau coat. And they were, somebody, like a, an interviewer, once like held him down and said, "Really, like, where where's your company? Like, where do you get this?" Money. He's like, oh, I got it from this company, and he gave him an address in San Francisco, and the uh-huh. guy went to that address, and it was an empty lot. So this guy, <laughs> so this guy is either like super shady or kind of insane. It's really Maybe hard just, to tell. He might just be, and, and what's what I think makes the room so fascinating and makes it linger in the consciousness more than most other bad movies because we've all seen bad movies, we've all seen <laughs> competent movies, and. Yet, we usually just go, oh, that sucks, and then we move on with our lives. People kept talking about The Room, watching The Room, recommending The Room, building a midnight audience for The Room. And I think the reason why is because The Room isn't a, a cheap – well, it is cheap, but you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not a, 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 a knockoff of anything. It's not like mm-hmm. trying to just be like this latest sci-fi channel original movie. It's not trying to like cash in on anything you know, with, involved with the zeitgeist. Right. It feels like someone tried to make a real – movie a meaningful movie and had no idea how to do that so even though we're laughing at how just weirdly inept it is we can tell there's a person who made it a weird inept uh, person well, who, who maybe doesn't even know their own mind but someone who tried and i think that is why the room well, the, connects and i think that's why the disaster artist got made uh, it's why the disaster artist got made. It's why the cult formed around it. The thing about the cult with the room, however, is that it's a cult of people who only enjoy the film ironically. I don't think that's true. There aren't people go. I have. You're the only person I've ever met who th- feels that there's something genuine coming out of the room. I've, I've met there's, other people. I don't know what the there, hell. There's. Uh, I, th- I equate this to reading like a, a teenager's first stab at poetry mm. after their first breakup. <laughs> like they've never tried poetry before. Mm. It's obviously genuine meaning, and they've no idea how poetry works and it's still like about a cat sitting on a mat but it's sad <laughs> like that's the room for me I, I, and i find I that spend, weirdly fascinating i, I found uh, well I, I ran with the rocky horror circles for a long time and right. the people who go to rocky horror generally speaking really love that movie there's, love a weird, there's a lot of great music in it even though it's strange and like badly paced if you've ever watched it without an audience but it's about it's, things it's, a, you know? it's about things the characters are really exciting the songs are really exciting it's kind of fun mm-hmm. and people go because they have fun watching it and there's a genuine affection the cult audiences for the room are the opposite they go because they like to jeer the movie well i mean that's and, a lot of them but and I- tommy we is this is just adds to his his enigmatic thing is that he claimed at first that he was making something very serious and very genuine, and then when he noticed that all of the ironic L.A. hipsters were laughing at it, he actually walked it back and said, no, it was supposed to be a satire this whole time. Which, again— And now he's kind of rolling with whatever the audience tells him. Well, and I think that's something that I also think makes you sort of understand a little bit about where he's coming from. He's desperately reaching out. Mm. He's desperately reaching out. And I think that's what The Disaster Artist is about. So The Disaster Artist stars James Franco as Tommy Wiseau. And he does a great Tommy Wiseau. Well, and like, ja- he's really convincing. James Franco is the perfect person to tackle Tommy Wiseau. Because yeah. Tommy Wiseau is such a mystery. And James Franco is kind of an enigmatic t- artist as is. Because he does like stoner comedies. Mm. But then he'll turn around and he'll direct a feature film version of a William Faulkner novel. And then he'll be on like The Young and the Restless for, for like yeah, and a then whole bunch of episodes. Like he just has a strange prolific bizarre and he'll he'll try anything I, I never saw interior gay bar but that's a weird idea it's a super weird yeah. idea he tried to recreate footage from a from a movie that, anyway it's from from, that from the movie cruising he tried to yeah. like 
do a biopic of the shooting of the movie Cruising. But only one part. But then he'll be in Oz the Great and Powerful, you know, like some big blockbuster. Yeah. So it's really hard to pin him down, this polymath James Franco. Yeah, sometimes he's amazing, sometimes he sucks. But he <laughs> always seems to be trying, and I appreciate that. And I think he really nails it here because he understands well, that— this is his best film for sure. Oh, absolutely. Well, yeah. for, as a director, definitely. It's yeah. an actor. It's between this and 127 hours. Mm. Um, but he is just this— there's a, the opening scene. I think it's the opening scene of uh, the disaster artist. Is uh, you meet uh, Greg Sestero, played by Dave Franco, James Franco's brother, and he meets Tommy Wiseau at a, a, an acting class. Mm-hmm. And Dave Franco is just awkward. He's mm-hmm. very handsome and likable, but he, there's no there's nothing genuine to his performance because I don't think he's really lived anything. Tommy Wiseau is just screaming in pain. On, and it's hard to watch. <laughs> His only line is, Stella! <laughs> but he's going for it. And you just, you see that it, out, underneath all of this strange artifice and confusion and mystique, he's a raw, uh, exposed nerve. That hmm. anything in this movie touches that nerve and it gets a reaction out of him. If you respond to him nicely, he becomes your best friend and devotes his entire life to making your life better. Better. And if you're mean to him, it destroys him <laughs> completely. He has no social grace. He has no understanding mm. of convention or culture or the industry. But he somehow he has the money and he refuses to give up. And he ends up making the worst fucking movie ever. <laughs> and I love that this movie but, understands just how mm. wrong he is. A lot of the time, not just in terms of craft, but in terms of how he interacts with other people. But it does appreciate that, well, he did it. <laughs> he made the movie. People liked it. There's well, something to be said for it. It's an outsider art movie. It, it's an like outsider it. art movie. It, it's, you know, it's immediate comparison is to Ed Wood sure. about sort of the the outsider who was just so passionate that it didn't matter that he wasn't talented. Um Tommy just wanted to make this movie more than anything. He wanted to make a real Hollywood movie. He wanted to act. Yeah. Uh, in in You want to be James Dean. In, in the narrative of the of the film. And you know, an acting teacher says, You're you're more like a Frankenstein's monster. He's like, no, yeah. I'm gonna you be You can be a bad hero. guy in movies real easily, and he refuses to accept this. He doesn't mm. want to be the villain because in his eyes he's the hero. Mm. And in all of our eyes, we're and, the and hero, you know? He, he's portrayed as being most assuredly deluded. And there's even talk early in the film about how he might have suffered a head injury at some point. So yeah. his, his sanity is up for question in in the narrative of the disaster artist. But uh, Greg Sestero doesn't quite care because he suddenly has this kooky benefactor who's a good friend of his. Yeah, they're really – he actually so they really move, has a lot of affection for They Tom move Boyce. to L.A. Tommy has an apartment there somehow. Already. <laughs> like a fur- fully furnished apartment. That he's just that he's never lived for. in. And he says the only reason he never, he never had anyone to go with. And you're just like, oh, Tommy. Tommy. <laughs> You poor thing. Uh, it just it, uh, that just raises all kinds of questions, doesn't it? Just like it, it's there's, so. And there's no, there's no like eroticism or romance between Tommy and Greg. Although you'd think that might be tempting, but no, mm-hmm. there's there's no like lover dynamic, which would have been weird with the two brothers. It, it would have, each but other. It would, it's like the obvious idea is that maybe. But I think honestly, it maybe that was intentional. Mm-hmm. Maybe. I mean, or at the very least, a side effect of getting two brothers to play uh, these characters because it doesn't have a creepy underpinning yeah, anymore. Yeah. It's just you only get uh, uh, the fraternal yeah, quality, yeah. The, the the just the friendship so, quality. The, these, and you see just how kind of wholesome it could have been, yeah. or at least it was at times. Yeah, but these these two tried to, tried to make it big. A, a, a chapter that unfortunately they skipped in the Disaster Artist was when Greg Sestero starred in Puppet Master Seven. I wish I could have seen, yeah. <laughs> seen him like, oh, I'm in this Puppet Master movie. I'm Just not sure mention where that it. Fits in. Retro Puppet Master. Yeah, I'm not sure if that was before or after the room. Actually, now that I think about it, but it would have been nice to hear it. Um, but yeah, Greg Sestero couldn't quite make it work. Tommy said, "Well, I got some money. Let's make a movie." Uh, the room was reportedly made for six million dollars, and, and it doesn't look and it there's at none all. of that money. Money is on the screen. You could have made this movie for fifty thousand mm. dollars, and it would probably be the same film. Yeah, he he shot on green screens when he didn't need to. Mm. He's, he shot he, in L.A. when he could have just gone to San Francisco where it's set. He recreated like an alleyway to shoot mm. in a soundstage, and the alleyway was literally outside the soundstage. Like, and exactly, they could just shot like, there. Yeah, just go like, outside the soundstage. Well, I don't want to ruin the, all the weird stuff if you're not familiar with the making mm. of the room. I. I I will say this. I think this is a very funny but very good-hearted movie that 
I think addresses some of these serious issues with Tommy Wiseau, mm-hmm. but clearly has a lot of affection for him, and I'm willing to go along with that over the purpose of this film, because yeah. I do think um, it's very supportive of the idea that strange people can have an impact through their art. Yeah, I yeah. think there's this idea that only certain kinds of people, like you have to be a certain way in order to make a movie, in mm-hmm. order to find an audience, and you don't. <laughs> you well, just have to do a, it. <laughs> there's a, a great, I guess this is now a subgenre of... Uh, the importance and the impact of bad artists. Sure. Uh, there was Ed Wood, there's yeah. the disaster artist. Uh, Tim Burton's Big Eyes could also be argued to be that. Uh, and uh, Christoph of, Waltz's character is the bad artist, but... He's the bad... Well, some people think that Carolyn Keene is a bad artist. And like they the, were wrong. <laughs> Margaret Keene. <laughs> or Margaret Keene, excuse yeah. me. Yeah. I love Big Eyes. I think Big Eyes is a Big, great movie. Big Eyes is really terrific. But yeah, yeah the, the sort of awful kitschiness that that the keen paintings brought to the american artistic landscape was seen as a a very negative thing by many many art critics there's a great bit in uh, big eyes when uh, Mm. you know they're talking about how like now she wants credit for all the paintings that her husband was taking and then Mm. jason schwartzman who played uh, an art gallery Uh owner he just says who would want credit? Yeah, it's like these, these are terrible. And like he walks past a, it's like a pick and save, and you can buy a keen, like a keen knockoff at pick and save now. And he just looks at all these paintings and goes, ah, "It's a movement." <laughs> like, but that's the point: is you don't know where. Uh-huh. You don't know what is going to connect with people until you make it, mm-hmm. until it gets out there, and the room, for better and maybe worse. Connected with people. I know a lot of people are connected to it ironically. Go back to the Hallmark conversation. Some people connected to it ironically. Uh Some people, I know I'm not alone on this. I might be in the minority, but I know I'm not alone. (laughs) I've talked to people who Mm. also appreciate the room as a, a, a quizzical. (laughs) <laughs> but certainly rather genuine attempt okay. to reach out and find someone who gave a shit about you. Mo- um, most of the people I've talked to and are, you, are, are... You're not talking either, to nice people. <laughs> or maybe not, but I'm not saying that people are necessarily just deriding the room, sure. but they're more fascinated by the strange mystery of the room. That's fine. And the outsider art elements to this than they are with any sort of emotional thing that Tommy Wiseau is trying to put into the okay, movie. I can appreciate that and I obviously I was exaggerating yeah. when I said you're not talking to nice people but <laughs> I, I, I'm coming at it from one angle and I think yeah. that, and I think one of the reasons why I like the disaster artists is that the makers of disaster artists clearly seem to have come mm. at it from the similar angle as I do mm. which is that he's no one knows what the hell is going through his head but we know he's trying to tell us. Well they're, they're trying to put some humanity into this thing which is just impossible to decipher yeah. and Greg Sister was the entryway, and he wrote a book about it, so luckily they had a lot of the details. Yeah, um, yeah it's it's really terrific. I liked it a lot. I liked it a lot, too. I, uh, I, I, I've been fascinated by the room. I never saw it with a live audience. I haven't either. I've only seen so it, like, I've at seen, home. I've seen it on home video, it. And, and it's, oh, it's death. <laughs> <laughs> I was fascinated. It's, it's so bad. <laughs> I was fascinated the entire way through. I, I, like, I, I think been, I need I to see it, it with a live audience, but I've heard the live audience experience isn't that great either, so I don't know. I don't know what eh, I'm missing out people of the People have room. different experiences on that. Let's move on. The other big... Uh, sort of award season release this weekend uh, is The Shape of Water, which is the latest film right. from Guillermo del Toro, right, uh, the director of Hellboy and Kronos and The Devil's Backbone and it, Crimson Peak and Pan's Labyrinth. It only opens in New York this week. Okay, uh, and well, it, it moves to L.A. next week and then the rest of the country will get it eventually. So we're going to be a little vague on this mm-hmm. one. Um, but The Shape of Water is a- another film that I think sort of reveals who Guillermo del Toro is. Because I think a lot of people think of Guillermo del Toro as a horror filmmaker or as like a comic book filmmaker. Mm-hmm. But if you look at, maybe with the exception of Pacific Rim or like Blade Two, like it's huge poppy mm-hmm. movies. Uh, he is a director of sort of morbid fairy tales. I think yeah, that's yeah, what he that's... does. I think that's, but I don't think people talk about it enough like that. I hear him talking about, oh, oh God, it's the pans- is it a horror movie? Is it Crimson Peak a good horror movie? It's not. It's this weird kind of magical gothic romance mm. and just has all these horror trappings. So we want to like close him off in that wall. Oh, I, should, I, I don't think that's much of a mystery. He's, just, he's, he's a fairy tale filmmaker. That's what he does. I think so too. I'm just mm. saying. I've heard some people maybe not articulate that. So right. I wanted to say it. And I think Shape of Water is. I think his best movie of that ilk, at least since Pan's Labyrinth, possibly since Kronos, which I actually like better than Pan's Labyrinth. I think I think it's his best English language film. I think the three films he made in Spanish are great. Mm -hmm. I think the the films he's made in English are spotty. (laughs) That's fair. That's fair. uh, There's there's no there's no Guillermo del Toro film I dislike. 
There's a lot of ones I, that have I, problems, but there's none that I dislike. I dislike Crimson Peak. I do not like that I think that you're film. wrong about that. I think you deserve that. I think maybe there's another shot. And Blade 2 is forgettable. But, oh, Blade uh, 2 is fun. You shut it, up. It's fine. Okay. And, and Mimic is cl- we, clearly him trying to get into Hollywood Did somehow. you see the director's cut of Mimic? I did not. It's, it's a lot better. Okay. It's quite good. It, the <laughs> I, ending I saw, I saw the it ending is still a problem because he couldn't shoot the ending the way he wanted to, mm. but like it's it's still better. Yeah, the giant cockroach monsters. That's some cool stuff um, in that movie. But yeah, he's now made it. This film is a film in English. It takes place in uh, the sixties. It, it takes place like in the early yeah, late fifties, early sixties, and it, so Cold War, height mm. of the Cold War, in a an American city that looks like something out of an imagination. Like it's it just looks like a, a, po- it looks like a, a postcard in Dark City. Yeah, it's, like it's an it's, amalgam of U.S. cities yeah. and. Uh, Sally Hawkins plays the main character. She is a mute janitor who works in some kind of bizarre science lab that you yeah. might see in a movie from the 50s, but given the Guillermo del Toro treatment. So everything's wet and mossy. <laughs> and uh, in, in, the, in her daily duties, she discovers that this science lab is harboring a gill man. Yeah, like from Creature from the Black Lagoon. They've found, like, the government has found, like, a gill man. They've brought it into this facility and they're going to study it. And there are basically three minds uh, uh, towards this. There's Mm -hmm. Michael Stuhlbarg, uh, who plays a scientist who has some secrets of his own. Mm -hmm. I won't reveal those. All right. Who wants, who thinks the creature is special. Mm. And needs to be taken care of. We can't mistreat it. We have to like sort of re- really, and it's intelligent. Really, yeah, and we have really, to- really study it and communicate with it. There's Michael Shannon who is in full premium rush mode uh, as this sort of o- overplaying it. I think a which little I know is hard it. to do with Michael Shannon. But I but think yeah. that's part of the fairy tale element, though. Like the, it's the ba- bigger bad guys, the big bad wolf. Everyone's yeah. a little bigger than they need to be, a little more heightened. Mm. Um, and he has a government agent who keeps zapping the creature with a cattle prod, mm. and he doesn't care about it. He just wants to dissect it, make sure the Russians don't get a hold of it, and move on. Mm. And then there's Sally Hawkins, who, as the janitor, is given access to all of these top-secret facilities only so she can do the mopping. Oh. But she ends up actually, like... Fe- well, feeding it and bonding with it. Yeah. yeah, and actually communicating with it as a person, not as an entity that needs to be studied. And it becomes romantic. <laughs> it's the creature from the Black Lagoon, and the creature from the Black Lagoon is... One of the few universal monsters that never really, that was always kind of felt like a monster. Like he never there, really there's felt not a like human a human element. To, if yeah, there was, like it was very subdued compared to the others. This is that version. If he finally got to fall in love with with a human person, like properly fall in love, like King Kong. Uh-huh. Well, uh, the, the that's cre- the movie. The, the creature is is still like a creature. Oh yeah, it doesn't talk. And it doesn't. It doesn't talk. It it. It's hard to tell what it's feeling at any given moment. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to tell how it feels until maybe the very end, where it starts to, like, do certain things. It clearly has a connection with Sally Hawkins, but there's, Mm. you're right, there are moments throughout where it seems like it's intelligent, it's a biped, (coughs) it's communicating, it's learning, Mm. you know, sort of a bit of sign language, perhaps, but then it'll do something which is clearly monstrous, Mm. or at the very least very animalistic and not human. And then the the, the doubts start pouring into your brain. It's like, are we maybe reading too much into this? (laughs) And yet, I think Guillermo del Toro keeps the whole thing steeped in a certain romanticism mm. that you, you'll have those little doubts, but I do well, think overall it's it's he's clearly in love with not only the monster, but with Sally Hawkins and in their relationship. Th- there is a certain uh, type of filmmaker, Guillermo del Toro and Tim Burton most specifically, who deal with this sort of fairy tale type of a narrative. Mm. And most of... Unironically, too. Uh, unironically. Yeah, like, look Gilliam up, I, will mess with it, but like they'll yeah, just Terry, tell you Terry, the story. Gil- Terry Gilliam, too, but uh, yeah. Um, but Gilliam will add sad Time. Tim Burton and Guillermo del Toro are very big on entering a kind of wish fulfillment romantic element to it. You look at Edward Scissorhands. Edward Scissorhands and The Shape of Water would make a great double feature. Fantastic double feature. Um, because it's about, it is about these strange creatures that become these romantic objects mm-hmm. for um, essentially lonely women. Sure. So there's a lot of loneliness and solitude in these fairy tale stories and how outsiders can only find love in the arms of things that are even further on the outside. Sure. And it's, as it turns out, that's an in, a new inside. And I think that that's really effective in Edward Scissorhands. Shape of Water's not as good as Edward Scissorhands. I, I can handle that. But 
it's it's in that same ballpark. I think it's lovely. I think there's some it's beautiful de- imagery very, in it. I it's think very it's, sweet. It has yeah. really great performances. I love Sally Hawkins. I think she's a little miscast, actually. You think? I think you needed somebody who is a little bit more of a, a like a wilting flower. Sally Hawkins um, is a little bit too energetic. No, no, I like that, um, though, because the idea is that even though she's been a wallflower, it's not because of... Her personality or being a wallflower hasn't gotten her completely down. She's mm-hmm. still a strong individual. And I, I like that element. I All think right. that works. Um, my, but my, yeah. My favorite character, though, is Richard Jenkins. Yeah, he's, he's, he's rock solid in this. Uh, Rich, he, Richard he, Jenkins plays. So, you're not really sure if they're a married couple at first or if they're related somehow. Yeah. It turns out they're just roommates. Uh, they're, live, or they're neighbors. They live like across the hall neighbor, from each yeah, other. They're, uh, they share a bathroom. They're, they're in each other's places all the time. And he's really chatty and really neurotic. And he's trying to get a job as a, a painter for advertisements. And he's mm-hmm. really insecure about his work. His character work in this is just fascinating. Oh, he's wonderful, and he, he and communicates he, so much with just like every tiny little twitch and tick. Well, and he creates this, this, and he creates this great parallel because we find out very quickly mm. um, that he's he's gay, and he's gay in a time when it is not uh, acceptable mm. socially to be gay, and that also sort of reminds you that Sally Hawkins' romance with a fish person, you know, there's actually like a real-world parallel. <laughs> Not that that has anything to do with, mm. with whatever, but my point is, is that, you know, just because society for, says for, it's... Quote, forbidden love. Forbidden yeah. love. It's a, it's a parallel for forbidden love. I, I apologize if I made that sound weird. But, like, <laughs> it, the point is, is that the love can be pure whether or not someone else approves of it. Mm. And... It works. Mm. I do think this is one of the better films of the year. I think it's a very oh, okay. particular vision yeah. that I really admire. Even though there are moments, there's a moment, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but there's a music-based moment in like the third act uh. that I think is way overplaying it's his hand. <laughs> I think it feels like the sort of thing that got shoved yeah. in because Guillermo del Toro thought it was neat, not because it worked. But the fact that it's in there and the fact that it feels like it's there just because the filmmaker was so passionate about it, is very intoxicating, and I I agree. I think this is mm. probably his best English language film. Certainly, it's his best film since Pan's Labyrinth, yeah, and yeah, yeah. it's it's really beautiful. And mm. I would recommend it to anybody. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely up there. He, uh, I don't always have patience for his fairy tale phantasmagoria. Mm. Crimson Peak bored the hell out of me. It's Fair like enough. I'm going to make this big, complicated thing. Great. Are you going to put characters or story in there? No. There were okay, characters and story in there. You <laughs> dink. What the hell? Uh, somewhere he had to look real hard. All right. Um, but this one actually does have the characters and the story, and he he seems to be going for something a little bit more than just the visual this time around, and I appreciate that. It's. Very sweet. It's kind of simple, but that can also be a, a really great great hook for a, a story like this, kind of because it's a fairy tale. All right. Well, uh, tell me about because I didn't see these other two. Okay. Uh, tell me about Voyeur. Uh, Voyeur is a documentary. It's on Netflix, and it is about a book that the famed reporter Gay Talese uh, tried to write about a voyeur that he had come into contact with named Gerald Foose. Uh, Gay Talese, uh, several decades ago, wrote a book called Thy Neighbor's Wife, and it was this big expose about uh, swinging and sexual proclivities in suburban America and how everybody's just up to all of this kinky stuff. And uh, people bought the book because it was so titillating, and he staged it as, you know, no, this is actually just journalism. I know it is titillating. But through researching this book, he ran into this guy named Gerald Foose. And Gerald Foose had a motel in uh, Colorado— that he had built so that it has a lot of crawl spaces and hallways that he was able to get into so he could peek through vents and spy on the his clientele. Oh, you know, horror. And, pardon? You know, horrifying. Uh, co- well, it's horrifying. Norman Bates, but less murder. He just spied on it's people. It's still and horrifying. He, it's still creepy. And he kept, you know, notes and wrote down, you know, who was staying where and, like, put dates and times and... You know, just he, he had a wife who was okay with this, and then they got a divorce, and he found another wife who was also okay with it. So he just had this horrible habit for a long time. Uh, many years later, after the, he was no longer in charge of the motel, he contacted Gay Talese and said, Hey, I got this story for you. Look at all of my notes that I've taken while I was spying on these people. I'm a big voyeur pervert. You should write a book about me. And Gay Talese said, Sure. Uh, now, Gay Talese is was 81, and this guy was 76, so I said, we need, we need to get hurry before one of us dies. And 
in writing about this guy, we started to get the sense that this guy, Gerald Foos, sure, he's probably this voyeur pervert, but he's also this compulsive liar mm. because he starts telling stories about how, how he, maybe he witnessed a murder. He told stories about, you, you know, who stayed at the hotel at certain times. And it, it turns out the dates didn't really shake out. But Gay Talese was so fascinated by this guy's need to get his proclivity out there that he continued to write about this guy. He wrote an entire book. And it wasn't until the book was about to be released that the Washington Post started finding some problems in the narrative. And he had to come out, and this is all on record, he had to come out and disavow the book, saying, I can't stand for this book. Please don't buy my book. I wrote it, and it has all these inconsistencies. It's not responsible journalism, so I have to disavow it. And then later he walked it back when new details came to light. But... The filmmakers stay more with Gerald Foose after that, and you get the feeling that the filmmakers are looking for another big shoe to drop. They're waiting for some kind of story to emerge out of Gerald Foose's life, and it never comes up. And that's really frustrating about watching Voyeur. Mm. They start making it about you know this fascinating Voyeur. Turns out it's about this compulsive liar, but they never come out and say that this guy is a compulsive liar. They just sort of keep on following him and let him letting him tell his stories and then they interview him and gay to together and it just it just sort of falls apart after a while you're not really sure what the filmmakers are trying to get at after a while so we do have a fascinating figure that might have been an interesting figure for a documentary film the relationship between him and gay to was pretty interesting they, they it's a good documentary combative. no it's not good documentary filmmaking because by the end they don't know where they're going so it, it start like the first third is really fascinating, really pulls you in, and then it just sort of meanders into nothingness. Um, I'm really okay with a documentary starting with one topic and ending with something else. That's a lot of documentaries. Yeah, a lot of times you did you, you see over the course tickled. Of- uh, no, tickled was great. That was yeah. a documentary from last year. I'm not going to say any of the secrets in tickled. It's about online all male competitive tickling websites and the shady things therein. Um, uh, you know, you even look at something like Bowling for Columbine. You know, mm. Michael Moore went out to make a, a documentary about, you know, why does Ameri- why do Americans have so many guns? Is that what leads us to violence? But then he goes to Canada and says, well, they have just as many guns, but not as much violence. What is it? And it becomes this sort of cultural examination rather than just about the gun industry. Um, so I'm okay with the fact that they didn't have a thesis all the way through. But it's like it's still they, it's still a movie. It's they, supposed to go to they, something. Yeah, they yeah. wanted the like a shoe to drop, and it never came. So yeah. it's really frustrating by the time it gets to the end. Well, is Princess Sid better? Princess Sid is better. Okay, what is Princess Sid? Princess Sid is a little C Y D. C Y yeah, Princess Sid. Uh, Sid is the title character is a a young sixteen year old girl who has a tragedy in her past. We learn right up front, and she's sixteen now. She wants to spend the summer with uh, her aunt. Or I guess it's a couple weeks uh, with her aunt in the big city, and she moves in with her aunt. And her aunt is a single woman. She's a successful author. She writes these uh, poetic, sort of very spiritual narratives about suffering young women, kind of like fairy tales, but more like just coming-of-age stories. And she's found a good niche for herself, the aunt. She uh, has a lot of coffee clatches, and people come over and they read poetry together. And mm. there's a really fantastic scene right in the middle where it's just a bunch of people sitting around reading their favorite passages from books. And it has that sort of warm, getting together, drinking wine feeling that you'd get together with a bunch of adult friends and do. Um, the teenage Sid is really kind of frustrated by this. She thinks that the aunt needs to go out and get, you know, get drunk and get laid a lot more and kind of party a little bit more to be alive. And that's a very conventional narrative we see in a lot of coming of age stories, how the old person's life is enlivened by the youth. Yeah. This is about the two trying to leaven each other a little bit. The girl wants to be kind of a party girl, the aunt wants to be kind of a homebody and they're teaching each other lessons, and there's a great conversation they have to that effect. That's nice. Teenage girl, meanwhile, is going out and meeting people and getting laid. She actually starts flirting and kind of falling in love with a young woman who works at the local coffee shop, and kind of how their relationship is very sweet and kind of rocky at first, and how they kind of eventually drift very closely together. 
And there's no big bomb beyond that. Yeah, there's no big plot point. Yeah, there's yeah. Uh, th- that's the whole movie. <laughs> that can be great. And it's it, it's really kind of sweet. It's very relaxing. Uh, it's almost so slight as to be insubstantial, in fact. Yeah. Uh, there that's, are, a, that's a tricky there are balance a few, to strike. Yeah. There, yeah, there's good characters, and I like the way they relate, and I like a, the, kind of a bits of atmosphere here and there. But for the most part, it really kind of just simmers very, very low. And that is going to be a great antidote if you're if you've seen like eight action films in a row and you want something just to calm you down that'll be the perfect thing for you yeah princess Sid is is just a, what an indie film ought to do really that's fantastic that's the the antidote all right so on our uh critically acclaimed scale of c minus to c plus what do you give princess Sid? princess Sid is a c okay c. sound like you're a little bit more enthusiastic than that well i'm, I'm just describing a lot that's going on in it but okay. it's not great at the end of the day okay uh, to see. Okay. Well, voyeur. Voyeur, a high C minus, like uh, ambitious and fascinating, but doesn't work. Doesn't. Yeah. Never. Never right. gels. Uh, the Shape of Water. I'm giving a C plus. Mm-hmm. I think it is uh, pretty damn enchanting. I think there's a few. There's a few critiques I have with it that I don't want to get into because it would like. Right. None of people have seen the movie yet, and I don't want to get into too many specifics. I think there's a few characters who are underwritten, mm-hmm. but like, it's really good and i think it it fires on its own wavelength yeah. so well yeah, yeah. i could have been a little tighter but yeah. a little tighter but um, like uh we on a no, c- I'll, I'll give it a really high c it's like right on the line between c and c plus that's it's, fair it's pretty high up. uh the disaster artist giving it a c plus i think this is one of the better love notes to outsider cinema we've mm-hmm. seen in a while and yeah, just really def- funny and and well put together definitely a c plus yeah and uh mistletoe in uh <laughs> i didn't see mistletoe you in. did not see mistletoe in on a scale of hallmark movie it's a c plus it's up echelon hallmark as a scale of just kind of kind of shabby low budget you know maybe could have used another rewrite rom-com mm-hmm. still a c <laughs> like it's still okay like it's certainly like if you just want something charming and christmasy with a little bit more on its mind than you'd think this will toy Hmm. This will do it. Then I'll give that a, a C in general, C plus on the Hallmark scale. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, <coughs> now, okay, so it's time to segue hmm. into the main event. And again, uh, every I, week. I love that your segue isn't a segue. It's, it, this it's is, time to segue. This is the segue. We have segued now. <laughs> the subject has changed. <laughs> Well, again, every week on Schmoville, we give we put out a poll of supposedly bad movies, all of them suggested by listeners of the show, and you pick a film. And this week, mm. you hated us. Yeah, you were mean. Yeah. Well, what this, I, was, this is uh, this is only like really, our, this is only like our fourth episode, but like it's definitely the worst one we've done so far. What I find fascinating is we we roll over the second place winner into the following week's uh, poll because it had a lot of uh, support, it, and we figured and, we might get another chance. Uh, and and that one has not been chosen yet. Not now yet. We, we get we've been it's usually surpri- like last. We've suddenly. been surprised by you, and uh, yeah, you decided to make us hurt. <laughs> We just threw Biodome on this list as just sort of a random, I'll just throw it on there. Uh-huh. And you just rallied around Biodome. Yeah. Have you seen Biodome lately? Because Biodome is a film that I actually, Biodome is one that makes me feel guilty. Because I saw Biodome <laughs> when it came out. And you were kind of okay with it? I was, I was. I mean, I was like, what was I, in like junior high or something when it came out? Was this 90, 96. I was a freshman out. in high school when okay. this came out. Not <laughs> I, encouraging. I was, a right? fresh, I was a freshman in college. I was beyond seeing it. Or yeah. I think it came out the summer in between high school and college for me. And like, I remember tolerating it, thinking a few bits were funny. Mm. I knew it wasn't good. But there was a lot of comedy like it at the time. You got to remember that the 90s were the decade of Polly Shore. Polly Shore was like a, was an empty. It was, it was a dark time. It really was. And I and listen. I like Polly Shore fine, near as I can tell, as a human being. I don't, I don't know anything terrible about him. Uh, but he was like an MTV type personality, mm-hmm. and he ended up as small roles in a couple of movies, like Class and, Act or Encino and, Man. I think Encino Man was his big break. It was like mm-hmm. Encino Man was the one people were like. Oh, Polly Shore. He's kind of like a, the comic relief. Uh, he's pretty good. Let's mm-hmm. uh, give him a couple of cheap uh, comedies. And he was in a bunch. In the nineties, well, now well, describe his personality. What what character did Polly Shore play? He played Polly Shore. Now, well, Polly well, Shore just describe that character. Polly Shore plays a character who is, at his heart, most of the time, mm. very innocent. But he is also uh, a, an aggressive agent of chaos. 
Yes. He is constantly mugging mm-hmm. and trying to start uh, catchphrases and doing weird physical motions repeatedly in the hopes that people in the audience will pick it up and build on his brand. He was like a meme before we had memes. <laughs> That's all he was. He was a meme generator in the mm-hmm. 90s. Like, if you ever said, but it, mm-hmm. that was Polly Shore. I and a lot of people did say, just, but it. I decided to cheese the weasel. The weasel was, uh, yeah. it made his way made its way into a lot of his catchphrases. Absolutely. And every but single he- one of his movies, was, he kept trying to throw more into the lexicon. He was a Generation X slacker type, mm-hmm. which was you know really common at the time. I, I was trying to think of. I mean, I know comedy duos go back to you know prehistoric times, but uh, what sort of the er example was of the Gen X slacker? And the, the best I could come up with was, was Bill and Ted. These two surfer dudes. Well, they weren't. Uh, oh, Bill and Ted were. Yeah, Bill and Ted. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So Bill, Bill and Ted were the yeah, these sort of. Two no good Nick slackers who could not perceive the world beyond their very limited scope of experience. Uh, this was honed to perfection with Beavis and Butthead. Um, it certainly found purchase in Wayne and Garth. Yeah. So uh, there are a lot of other comedy duos of this exact type that were brushed off to the side, didn't quite catch on. Well, one thing that's weird about Polly Shore is that he's clearly mm. like the Jerry Lewis character in a comedy duo. He's yeah. the broad, brash one who's supposed to be sort of measured next to someone who's a bit more of a straight person, and yet he never found his partner. Uh-huh. He never ha- There was never Polly Shore and blank. He was always paired with someone different every single time, and I think a lot of the time, whether or not his movies are watchable... <laughs> has to do with the quality of his partner. In Encino Man, he had Sean Astin mm-hmm. and Brendan Fraser as well, so that was a good group. Those are talented people, and they can... Polly Shore doesn't seem so weird when he's confronted with people who are being a little genuine. Well, uh, and, and you had, you had a, an actual straight man with Sean Astin. Yeah. He wasn't with another weirdo. Well, and then, you, and then you look at something like Son-in-Law, which I would argue is the probably the only, like, besides Encino Man, which is more of, like, a Brendan Fraser movie. Mm. Of all the quote-unquote Polly Shore movies... Son-in-law is the only one that even remotely holds up. <laughs> Son-in-law is a halfway good movie, and a lot of it is because a lot of it is because Carla Guccino. It's oh, one of her, is, it's one of her is, first okay. starring roles, and she'd been in acting before. It was one of her big breakout roles, mm-hmm. and she plays this uh, small town girl who goes to I think it's UCLA or some like big city school, and she's kind of overwhelmed. And Polly Shore is her wacky resident advisor, and he takes her under his wing, and she f- experiences new cultures and has fun. And then she brings he has nowhere to go for Thanksgiving, so she brings him back home to her small town farm for Thanksgiving. And he's so weird in this environment, mm-hmm. and that's a perfectly good delivery system for Polly Shore. Like, you All can right. get away with that. There's things that don't work in it, but it's okay. Good cliche fish out of water story. That's that'll that's all you need. The problem with biodome, and again, the basic concept of biodome is you might recall there were these sort of biodome experiments that were going on in like the 80s and 90s mm. with the idea of we're going to build this hermetically sealed environment to see if people are going to be able to live like this in outer space. And I remember yeah. seeing a lot of news reports about this. Mm. I guess they all turned out fine, but. Um, they, uh, the idea is there's a biodome that's full of very serious scientists, and Polly Shore and his best friend, played by Stephen Baldwin, get trapped mm-hmm. inside with them, and they can't leave for a year, and so there are these agents of chaos ruining the entire experiment. Mm. I can see mm. where you're coming from. There's, their, a, there's name, a movie in there somewhere. Their names are Bud and Doyle. Yeah. But they go by also Squirrel and Stubbs, which is confusing. It's unnecessary, but whatever. They have nicknames. Mm. The, but the thing, one of the things, of the many things that doesn't work in Biodome, is that there's the straight people mm. are not partnered with Polly Shore. If anything, Stephen Baldwin is trying to out Polly Shore, Polly Shore, yeah, yeah, this yeah. entire time. They are so broad together mm. that they are just nails oh, on a chalkboard abrasive. I, I remember uh, Roger Ebert talking about Beavis and Butthead as they're not really two separate characters. They're just one personality that's been bifurcated, so it has something to talk about with itself. Yeah, And I feel like that was the approach they were going for in Biodome. They were trying to have two very similar, equally dumb characters who, when you put them together, almost had a brain cell. Right. And... 
you can get away with that in animation. Yeah. Because, the, you know, when somebody gets hurt in animation, it's okay because it's just a drawing. When you try to do that sort of thing here, it comes across as just messy, crass, and kind of disgusting. Well, you need... Here's the thing. Comedy requires contrast. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to have, you know, these really wacky characters... Uh, and again, in a cartoon environment, you can get away with it a little bit more because everything is big and broad, sometimes. Mm-hmm. Well, at least you can do that in animation more easily. Uh, in, in live action, you're going to have all these characters who aren't in on their joke. Mm. Now, I, I refer to this as Agents of Chaos because I think there's two ways to do this kind of a story. The idea is that there is, and in this case, quite literally, a hermetically sealed environment mm. where everything's supposed to be just so. And then people <laughs> come in and mess it up. There's two versions of this story. One, the hermetically sealed environment is... Uh, oppressive or mm. broken or corrupt and you bring in the agent of chaos and they actually they make it better the corruption, yeah. and then you like them for it mm. that could have worked in biodome if we had found out that the biodome was actually like a secret government uh, or, or operation that was going to have some sinister consequence yeah. you probably could have gotten away with it and it would have been fine because it would have been like bugs bunny messing with yosemite sam mm. you know like everything bugs bunny does is justified the problem is, this is the other kind, where the society, where everything is, is nice, is being wrecked yeah, by, yeah. by people who are <clears throat> just sort of malevolently or absentmindedly to the point of, of might as well be malevolent, mm-hmm. uh, destruction. Mm-hmm. They are fucking with a huge experiment that is actually really, at least they think, <laughs> super important to the future of mankind, and they're just breaking everything mm-hmm. and making everyone's life worse. They say, hey, that's our drinking water. Oh, I'm going to fart in it. Isn't that yeah. funny? It's, it's not like funny. They did not deserve that. They're just scientists trying well, to make here, the world better. Here, yeah, here's the problem. You know, Biodome, and it's... They cast William Atherton from Ghostbusters. And at, Die Hard. At, and Die Hard. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, a really well-known, smarmy character actor uh, as the like, head of the Biodome. Like, you see him and you expect he's playing and the bad guy. You expect he's playing the bad guy, but more than that, you expect he's the dean at... The, he's like the uptight dean at the Chaos College. Yeah. He's the guy from Animal House who wants all of the, the Chaos guys to settle down a little bit. Yeah. He's the square. He's the man. Mm-hmm. He, he's the... The establishment that these Gen X anti-establishment losers are trying to rail against. And I think the film assumes that when we see these biodome scientists trying to do something very noble, that we're go- instantly going to be annoyed by that and we're going to want to see the biodome ter- torn apart. Right. The film is assuming that we hate the biodome <laughs> and that we hate William Atherton and that we want to rip that apart with our bare hands, and that we commonly want to do this. And in fact, there's a lot of talk in this movie about how the environmentalist movement is a big inconvenience, and it's really obnoxious. Uh, yeah, they, uh, Bud and Doyle have uh, girlfriends mm-hmm. who are genuinely into saving the environment. They're obviously too good for these guys. They're, I mean that. They're, 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 they, they're nice people who care mm-hmm. about things, and you don't understand. They have a brief conversation at the beginning where they say they know these guys are stupid. Mm-hmm. They hate them. They're manipulative jerks. They repeatedly try to cheat on their girlfriends through flat-out sexual uh, uh, assault. assault. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a couple of times, because there's a couple of female scientists in the Biodome. Mm-hmm. One of them was played by Kylie Minogue uh-huh. before she was as big a superstar as she became. Um, I think she was already an MTV personality at this I, point. No, Kelly but... Minogue was, I think, was like an Australian singer, mm. and then she became like a big crossover international star yeah. a couple of years after this. Um, her, 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 go her, ahead. Kylie Minogue's character is named Dr. Petra Von Kant. Explain the reference. Okay. The Bitter Tears of Petra Von Kant was a Rainer Werner Fassbinder film from the 1970s about really, really well-dressed lesbians hating each other in a really posh environment for 90 minutes. That's it. It's like... That's a, a weird lot of, reference a for lot of, A lot of still shots of the interiors and like these, these lesbian characters kind of saying how much they hate each other and then they sleep together and then they still hate each other. It's a fa- it's it's a one of Fassbender's better known films. Yeah. The Bitter Tears of Petrovic. It's a Kant, relatively but, famous title, whether or not you've seen it. But yeah. yeah. So... You get the impression that some people, bless them, were trying in this movie. <laughs> but, again, you, even though you, you, you have this expectation of William Atherton being the bad guy, mm. nothing in the narrative supports that until Bud and Doyle push him really far. In fact, yeah. he's initially like, hey, listen, 
uh, this is unfortunate, but let's make the most of this. We can mm. actually like use this as an opportunity to a learn. A chaos and- element in a situation like on a distant planet might be something you have yeah. to deal how with. Bad this can is these, our chaos how element. bad can these guys possibly be? He's actually very accommodating for a while, and then as Bud and Doyle like mm. kill off the rare endangered species that they had had in the mm. biodome, like after a while, he, yeah, like he starts poisoning blowing. their water supply. Yeah, it's just he, awful. He starts blowing a gasket, and he actually has them. It's actually pretty funny. He he uh. uh what, what is it? He, he he puts mar- them in the he maroons them in the desert the desert enclosure yeah so now they're just dying in there mm. and after a while everyone's like hey we think Bud and Doyle have been in there long enough and everyone's like no no they're not dead yet <laughs> <laughs> and you know what mm. I sympathize well you know what? it would have been great if the, if it had taken like this Michael Haneckian kind of dark <laughs> turn where they actually do die and now that it's about the scientists having to deal with the fact that they committed murder and what do they do with the bodies and it turns out dead bodies is what the biodome needs <laughs> wouldn't that be great that would have been a great good movie that would indeed be be pretty damn amazing but yeah but like so the the plot kind of implodes a bit when Bud and Doyle, while they're marooned in the desert, mm. they find that one of the windows still has the key in it. <laughs> so they're able to just get they're out. They're able to yeah. just get out, which of course ruins the whole experiment. Yeah, once you open the door, the entire... Well, I mean, the go, entire thing is them ruined. going in has pretty much ruined it as is, but they but try like, to you, roll with you, it. You could have played it off. It could have been well, like, okay, we can make this work somehow, a, but then once the door's open, literally it's all about the window. There, there's also this unfortunate subplot with uh, Henry Gibson, of all people, who plays the guy who's funding this entire experiment and how Bud and Doyle are good for press. Yeah, these making t-shirts kind of, and action figures. Yeah, yeah, these, shit, these yeah. kinds of youth, youthful energy makes them more relatable to the youth market. and So, but the film doesn't run with that either, you no. know, that, that we kind of have to make sure these guys behave in the biodome because they're actually good for the experiment in this sort of way. Yeah. But, but no, they just sort of walk out and they have a party and they yeah, and they, they wreck the bio like at the biodome. Yeah, the party, by the way, is played like the band at the party is Tenacious D. No, the the Tenacious D is not the band at the party. I thought they were. The, oh, you're right. Tenacious D is the band at the the environmental sit in that they have earlier in the movie. I, I apologize. You're right, the but they are in the movie. The band at the party is the real life band Wax. If you remember Wax from the 1990s, no one remembers Wax. No, I think Wax doesn't. I remember think members wax. of Wax don't remember Wax. <laughs> Wax is on the soundtrack. They have a huge party. They wreck the biodome, mm-hmm. and the biodome is like there's a whole like a uh, uh, like a digital readout that says how much homeostasis has been maintained, and the mm-hmm. whole idea is got to maintain 100 percent homeostasis. If it goes down, they got to bring it back up again within mm-hmm. the year, and it's down to like 0. .01 <laughs> or something <laughs> which, after this which party. Is like this apartment right now, you know, it's, yeah, it's it's, it's yeah. not great. So, but but and Doyle actually end up like convincing all the scientists to after they're told to leave, the experiment is over. You fucked up, probably wasted millions of dollars. Mm. They convince everyone to stay and try to fix the biodome. I can appreciate that, but well, at the it, same time, there are a few scenes in the montage where they they use detritus from the party to fix things from the biodome, and I kind of liked that. It's well, like, well, I, we need a new reflector. Well, why don't we just flatten out all these old beer cans, right? Well, and can, make do with what you have. Well, and there's there's a message I think they're trying to get at here, which is that the world is damaged but fixable. Yeah, and indeed, even people like Bud and Doyle are fixable, that they can grow, and that mm. they can hopefully make up for past mistakes. Problem is, is that the movie just so fucking sides with them throughout the entire time mm. that this whole redemption arc doesn't work because the movie doesn't hate them enough. Well, it doesn't hate them enough. It doesn't, it doesn't it, it see lets, them as problems It enough. lets them off the hook for everything. You yeah. mentioned that there's a sexual assault scene. Yes, they look for beds, and they just get into bed with Kylie Minogue and the other hot female scientist. Yeah, whose name escapes me. And, and they just and start they, groping them. Yeah, and they just start feeling them up, and they're pushed out of the beds. They get hit. These guys should be, like, beaten into pulps for that. Yeah, that's and they, that was and, never cool. And those scientists should never find them attractive later on in the movie, as they, they do. And they do. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's messed pretty up. pretty gross. It's, it's, it's quite gross. And you now can tell that, like, a lot of these other actors, again, William Atherton, uh, he's a guy who got stuck in the same role over and over again. My favorite <laughs> version is actually Real Genius. No, he's great in Real yeah, Genius. Yeah. I love Real Genius. But, like, even Kylie Minogue, you can tell that she has, like, so much personality and that she's so likable mm. and you just sort of wonder god this was the best you could get after street fighter the movie huh <laughs> like this was this was what you had i think she's doing okay she's it, doing great now i've kylie always, minogue is doing just i have fine. a lot of respect for kylie minogue mm. it's that's that's not the issue but like no, she, she, it, my point is that i showed up in doctor she was, who once it was weird that's right that was a good episode too. <laughs> it was the titanic in space episode 
was a great episode. I love Kylie Minogue. I right. think she's great. I like people in this. Mm-hmm. Again, I've liked Polly Shore in things. Okay. I've even liked Stephen Baldwin in a few things, at least in the 90s. My and stuff goodness, like goodness, you're forgiving. What? Well, like, well, anyway. well, usual suspect. Yeah, but like, yeah, no, this is, there's, I think... <laughs> there's, there's two things I wanna, I, I'm so I'm so scattered. Right? There's there's just two things I want to I want to bring up before we move on. Mm-hmm. One, the opening credits of Biodome are an assault. They are a punch in your brain. Just random, <sighs> shitty, frightening images mm-hmm. that have nothing to do with anything. Mm-hmm. It's like an experimental video. It's like the first draft of the opening credits of seven. Like, it's just so <laughs> angry the, uh, and d- gross and meaningless there was that a, it just kind of boils the film up in a nutshell. There was a, uh, they called it MTV editing because this is where that, that aesthetic came from. And there are mm. movies that did it well. If you've seen oh, yeah. uh, Freaked, for instance, does that same sort of thing, but it's this weird, chaotic animation in that one there has to be purpose this one it, it it's sort of like random shots of like little kitschy i like gen x friendly items the lyrics of the song that is playing appear on the screen as they sing them and it's supposed to create this sort of music video vibe and i think that's what they're trying to go for they're trying to appeal to the gen x market they have no idea how gen x works no now I'm I'm technically Gen Y, although evidently that doesn't exist anymore. So I guess I'm Gen X. <laughs> but uh, I call myself Gen Y all up until recently, and then they say, "Nope, you don't have a generation anymore." Well, fine. What what else is new? Yeah. But uh, yeah, they're trying to get into that MTV uh, ethos that, that Generation X was really behind, and also that kind of anti-establishment vibe that Gen X was behind. But and the anti-establishment vibe bec- uh, was sort of like a child of punk. In the 1990s, if you mm-hmm. recall, a lot of the grunge stuff was very much a child of, of punk rock. And fighting against the establishment went fighting against the man, that is, the government, that is, the people who are oppressing you. There's nothing oppressive about a biodome. No, it's actually in fact, in- inherently harmless. Hating, hating the biodome is something the man would do. They flipped the script on this. Yeah, they kind of ruined the way comedy works. Yeah, like yeah. that's my point. Like, my point is that you well, know, no, a, they, they, they th- fundamentally misunderstand their own audience. Well, again, and I just think even comedically, you know, you look at like the Marx Brothers when they came into Fredonia in Duck Soup, which also probably would have been a good double feature for this. Actually, now that I think about it, <laughs> um, you know, they were there were stuffy socialites who didn't understand anything, and mm. so throwing the Marx Brothers in there, wrecking their party, that party is better for it. That's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is more like Gremlins, where like <laughs> that's I had, a great comparison. Like, and listen. I know people like have affection for the gremlins, but the gremlins are evil monsters who are wrecking everything and trying mm. to kill people. That's Bud and Doyle, just they're not actually like cannibal. They're not actually carnivorous. They're not just trying yeah. to eat anything. Like that's it. Mm. Like that's they're they're just. And you know the other thing that was kind of weird about this, and I never noticed this before. You ever notice they have like a weird sub dom relationship, Bud and Doyle? Or like they kind of abuse each other. No, like like there's this lot of scenes of like flashbacks of them like with like Polly Shore leading Stephen Baldwin around by like a, a leash and oh, like yeah, feeding yeah. him things and uh, talking about how you know Doyle only gets to do things after Polly Shore does them. There's this one bit. It's one of the most disgusting things I've seen in a, in a while in a movie where they're hanging out watching TV and Polly Shore makes Stephen Baldwin bite Polly Shore's toenails. Bite, bite his toenails off, which he does on camera. I know. No, like it's, it's and I'm just un- like unsimulated, and it's just like, and you're just watching this, and just like there is some their relationship is is mm. very particular. <laughs> well, <laughs> That's I mean, all I'm gonna say. That's a very in there's those, a lot going on there. In those flashbacks, we do get to see like how abusive uh, Polly Shore's mom was. Polly Shore's mom played by Patty Hearst. Very weird. <laughs> in like two scenes, but you know, I was the other thing is, and this is the last thing. I was watching this uh, uh, with my wife, and I was thinking about the culture that produced it and i had one take and Mm. she had another uh my take was this is kind of like that speech in the third man where like the 90s was a relatively affluent time there's actually a joke in biodome about this guy who's like so crappy you'd think he would be completely used to society but he has a job anyway Mm. and then someone says how did you get a job and he says fucking bill clinton yeah like at a time when economic prosperity was actually like annoying to slackers like oh god it's too easy to get a job like weird time and that's also this is also kind of like the the world that fight club came out of the idea Mm. of an entire generation that didn't feel oppressed enough to be interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was looking at this like, <clears throat> this is like the cuckoo clock that comes out of Switzerland. <laughs> and and the 
let's like you know this is not the renaissance this is like this is chintz this is not what struggling bequeath this is what ease bequeath and and michelle michelle to her infinite credit corrected me she said no you don't understand cuckoo clocks are well-crafted timepieces <laughs> that actually have some artistry to them and give people joy. This is the canary in the coal mine. Mm-hmm. This is culture screaming for help <laughs> and saying, "Please don't let us become this." Uh, and I look uh, at I look at it now, and I'm just like, "God, this this really was this." And then Fight Club would have been another good double feature mm-hmm. for this because it's just like this was the '90s saying, "We're there's something wrong. We got, this there's is, something wrong with us right now." This is America on its knees yeah just begging someone to help it <laughs> now biodome by the way i just want to make clear we're probably gonna if we keep doing this podcast we're probably gonna see a lot of movies that come out in january mm. i want to bring up the other movies that opened opposite biodome oh on you january, look that up oh, please, on january 12th 1996 tell me. okay now if, you, if you're not familiar with this january is frequently a dumping ground in hollywood for movies that are kind of lowbrow or uh, they don't want to like they don't want they're still working off all of their big Oscar contenders that are opening getting wider releases in mm-hmm. January so they don't want to distract with a bunch of A ticket releases so you get a bunch of weird genre films and dumb comedies in January most of them are very bad a lot of the time so on January 12th 1986 we got Biodome uh-huh. we got Dunstan checks in the chimp movie yes okay although I think it was an orangutan was it was I think it Dunstan orangutan? was an orangutan Okay. Yeah. I, an ape. All an right. ape of some sort. We got Don't Be a Menace to South Central while drinking your juice in the hood. Mm-hmm. A movie I actually have some fond memories of, but I'm worried about going back to it now after the whole biodome incident. <laughs> we got Two If By Sea, the romantic comedy starring Dennis Leary and Sandra Bullock that no yeah. one remembers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Lawnmower Man 2 Beyond Cyberspace. Oh, I saw that one in theaters. You were the one! I was one of eight people who paid money out of my own pocket that I earned myself and saw in theaters. This was a really bad time to go to a movie. Yeah, that, this was, was a really terrible That time. might be one of the worst weeks in the entire like t- last 30 years. Yeah, just brutal. <laughs> so we talked a lot about a couple of things we could have done for a double feature mm. of this. And if you've seen the title, you know where we're going with this. It's a bit on the nose. But I think it's apt. Mm. And I think actually a couple of people, actually, when we announced we were doing this, said this would be a good one. And they're right. This is because it's what we picked. Mm. Um, So Biodome is a story about a bunch of uh, guys who are supposedly funny inside a trapped, hermetically sealed enclosure. It's completely wrecked, and they have to find some way to survive. Mm. It's also the plot of The Martian. <laughs> the Ridley Scott film from a couple of years ago. Which is a really good which movie. Which is actually an incredibly good movie. And in fact, the, the Martian is kind of like the perfect version of Biodome. Yeah. Because it is about this hermetically sealed environment. It is about introducing an element of chaos. It mm-hmm. is about having to use the resources at hand to fix the problems. But ultimately, and this is what I love about The Martian. I agree with it. It's a about the good humor of the protagonist. It's mm-hmm. about the sense of humor of the protagonist, in fact, being depicted as a survival trait. Yeah. The uh, idea, the capacity to stay positive, mm. to work problems, and to uh, uh, face incredible difficulty mm. with grace and wit is the only thing that keeps Matt Damon alive. He would have lost his mind yeah, yeah. if he didn't have the capacity for that in The Martian. Now, The Martian, if you haven't seen The Martian, it stars Matt Damon as an astronaut mm. in the, like, the first Martian uh, sort of it's not a colony, but they've set up a, an environment, an enclosed environment. And there's, there's like a, a small team of astronauts mm-hmm. uh, have landed on Mars and they're studying on Mars and a storm is a brewing. Yeah. On, on the surface of Mars, and the other, all they all start to gather up to get back on the ship to launch back into orbit. Yeah, and as an emergency exit. Mm-hmm. And while they're getting on the ship, and it's a great sequence. They're like mm-hmm. it's the first like it's a sort of big actiony type sequence you'd normally say for the end of a movie, but this is the inciting incident. Everyone gets on the spaceship, and Matt Damon's character, who is the botanist, uh, <laughs> he's knocked away by the winds. They have to make a tough call, mm-hmm. and they have to leave him there, assuming he's dead. Turns out he's not dead, mm. and now he's trapped on Mars. And he's trapped on Mars, and they don't, and they can't go back and get him. This yeah. is Mars. This is not like so far in the future that they can just launch another ship. This and, is like, and everyone NASA. assumes he's dead, so they're not looking, and mm. they can't tell he's there. So Never he, before has anyone been so isolated in the history of humanity. So he's he's isolated. He has to, and the film is very much a. Uh, uh, 
procedural as to mm-hmm. what he needs. And he, he actually says it to us and he narrates and he listens to music. The only music he has is the music left behind by his captain and it's all disco hits and he hates it. <laughs> but it's the only music he has. So he's constantly <laughs> listening to this disco that's driving him crazy. <laughs> So yeah, like trudging through the Martian landscape, looking for batteries of a rover that might be nearby, and he has to get out there just in time so he has enough battery power to get back before he suffocates, and he's listening to, like, Dancing Queen. Yeah. That doesn't sound so bad to me, but I guess he doesn't like disco that much. It sounds like hell to a lot of people. There's probably, like, a year of my life where, like, the only album I listened to was Abba Gold. Yeah, I know it's the greatest hits album. I don't care. Those are the greatest hits. Everybody, uh, <laughs> it's the greatest of greatest hits. <laughs> everybody has a year of Abba Gold, right? In their history, Abba just Gold a, is just mu- as everybody has a year of classic Queen as well. Okay, yeah, okay. So listen, there are certain uh, uh, greatest hits albums mm-hmm. you're, you, that are absolute required. I think you're required to have Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers' greatest hits, mm-hmm. Billy Joel's greatest hits volumes one and two. Three is optional. <laughs> <laughs> you got Abba Gold. Uh-huh. You got classic. You got uh, classic Queen. I think you need all three. Well, it, Classic Queen, Queen's Greatest Hits, and Greatest Hits Volume 2. All three of them they, together. You, you can you get know. them all in one box. Serious question, though. Mm-hmm. Changes? Changes Bowie, yeah, sure. You, you think changes? Because oh, I have, You know what? You can just get a, a Bowie record Pretty much well. any Bowie yeah. record is a Greatest Hits record. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. So there's some debate on mm-hmm. changes. Uh, but Legend, Bob Marley and the Wailers. Bob Marley Legend. Legend. Yeah, that's a good one as need well. that one for sure. All right. But that's it. <laughs> there are no other Greatest Hits albums. That are that are required no, to, for you. everything own. else is just slacking off. Like, everything else you should listen to the albums. Those are like... And granted, all those people did great albums as well. Mm. Those are the Greatest Hits albums you're allowed not to be ashamed of. Yeah. Uh, you know what? If, if you're going to get a box set... A box like, set is different. If you're going to get like a multiple disc set not that's talking, nothing but hits, like Johnny Cash or something, that's, that's a okay. different thing. That's yeah. a different thing. That's also acceptable. We're in fact, that's on. impressive. <laughs> We're on a tangent. We are on a tangent. So, uh, yeah. So that's I think that's the recurring theme. Uh, the Martian, I believe, was nominated for the Golden Globe for Best Comedy, and there was some controversy over that. It, it is makes a comedy. sense. Yeah. It's, it's about humor, and mm. I think that that actually is valid. It's a lot more valid. I think Get Out is pretty funny too. I think calling it a comedy for the Golden Globes is a huge fucking stretch. No, it's, it's about it's a horror too, movie. It's about too many horrible things. Mm. The Martian is about overcoming horrible things mm. with positivity. It's actually and, a very light movie about a very severe and, situation. And Matt Damon is such a funny and affable and likable actor that mm. he's he pulls it off what, with what looks like complete ease. He's yeah. just completely in his element here. Yeah, and he has to spend. He's in the center of the screen for the bulk of this film. It's so it a lot, of, a lot of it. And he's yeah, narrating for a log, you know, what he's what he's about to do. And we also get to see him doing the things and he's always he always has some sort of comment. Mm-hmm. And you can tell that's a natural part of him. You can tell it's a natural part of Matt Damon. Mm-hmm. But you again you can also tell that this is what he's saying to survive. Like he has to uh fertilize his own crop. His yeah. indoor crop of food. And all he has is potatoes. So he's essentially surviving just on potatoes and recycled water. How is he going to fertilize these potatoes in Martian soil? Well, it turns out he has human waste. Yeah. And he has to break into the human waste vat, the bilge, essentially, and start dumping out the waste onto the potatoes. He has to, like, stuff his nose, and he opens the bags, like, Oof. For some reason, each of the bags is personalized. <laughs> Like, every time you go to the bathroom, I guess they're weighing how much waste you give out. So think, they put your name on the bag. I think they're poop. weighing it. I think that also makes sense in case someone, like, has an infection or yeah, something kind like of that. Yeah, you their you know. spore. Yeah. So, like, he opens one up. He's like, oh, God, Gomez. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's how you do a stink joke. Yeah, that's, that's... That's not a biodome farting in the water. That's actually, like... That's a funny poop joke, and that's hard to do. So hard to do! <laughs> I have nothing but respect. If you can pull off a good... I'm not saying there are no good fart jokes. Mm. I'm saying if you can pull one off, you're a master. Yeah. Because they're just, they're lazy humor most of the time. (laughs) If you can do it, like the BFG. Seems so much BFG uh, yeah, there has an incredible, oh, fun, wonderful fart an sequence. An entire scene of like nothing but farts mm. and in a Spielberg movie. <laughs> it's a great thing. I'll just say corgi goes, corgis go rocketing everywhere. I think it's important to recognize that I think a lot of people. Everything kind of came together mm. in The Martian. Um, we have a great lead performance by Matt Damon. We have an incredibly... I've read the book. It's okay. a good book. But it's incredibly technical. Yeah. And, it's yeah, yeah. A, and it has to be, because that's what it's all about. It's mm. about, here are all the problems. Here's how we solve them. And they have to be solved through science. We gonna, need to, I was going to mention this. We need to explain it to the audience... And we need to make sure that it's always moving forward, that there's always tons of personality. And I think a ton of credit mm. needs to go to, to Drew Goddard 
who adapted the screenplay. Yeah, yeah. For, um, that's a, that was I'm surprised <clears throat> that didn't win the Oscar for best adapted screenplay. That was such a deft. Drew Goddard, if you don't know, he used to write for Lost. He used to write for Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He uh, co-wrote and directed uh, Cabin in the Woods. Mm. Uh, he's really, really talented. So that's a great little bit there. But the other thing, and I think it's someone who people either give him no credit or too much. Mm. Uh, is Ridley Scott. Okay. Ridley Scott is one of those filmmakers who has made brilliant movies and very bad movies. He's made, a, he's made more, more bad movies than brilliant movies by a long shot. Possibly the case. Sometimes he does both because you'll see like this crappy Kingdom of Heaven and mm. then you see his director's cut and you're like, oh, that was actually a good movie. <laughs> like, there was all these things that make sense now then mm. they just cut him out for no good reason. So, but what I think is interesting about Ridley Scott is I think Ridley Scott is one of those directors... Who will make what you give him? Yeah, Where, yeah, yeah. But he won't. He can't elevate <coughs> it if it sucks. But if it's great, he'll make it great. Well, and he doesn't seem to be too discerning with what you give him. Mm-hmm. Like he'll, you hand him a screenplay, he's like, okay, I'll make this, and I'll just try to find the best way to make this and make it visually interesting to keep myself entertained. It doesn't matter the quality of the screenplay. He's not even paying attention to that. Yeah. So you give him a screenplay to Alien. You know what? He's going to make a classic movie because that that's going to be amazing. That's a tight ass screenplay, and that's a tight ass movie, and I love that movie. It's not a tight ass movie. <laughs> it's not like uptight. It's it's just it's a tight movie. It's love a great it. movie. Uh, I love I love Alien. Yeah, uh, great. You you give him something like The Martian, which is in. Accurate in a way that gets nerds really, really excited. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it it knows its astronomy. It knows it, the way that technicals, the technical ins and outs of astronaut life on Mars. It knows the way gravity works and the yeah. way you know ships have to communicate he and the likes, actual time it takes to do these things. Ridley Scott loves detail. And you look at um, Blade Runner, you look at Alien, you look at Legend even. Like anytime he gets to sort of create like a whole world, he loves those details. Mm-hmm. And that really makes all the difference. And that the, the that world was endemic to the screenplay mm-hmm. really helped that it made sure that Ridley Scott was actually a good match for the material. Mm-hmm. And I think if you it were kept to give him him focused. more persnickety screenplays then he'll do better. Yeah. You give him philosophical screenplays like Body of Lies or God, for, or God Forbid, The Counselor. Well, I was thinking even Prometheus, yeah. which is just like so much big about it. it's it's like the hugeness mm. of its you know religious parables and and mm. sort of big high ideas, concepts yeah. that the plot and the characters fall way yeah, to the, the side. Mm. I know you like that movie more than I, I do, but you got to admit I dig the hell out of, out stuff, of Prometheus because of the philosophical stuff. But yeah, I, I will will concede that the plot doesn't <laughs> quite fall together the way it should. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I think Ridley Scott was reined in for once yeah. by the screenplay for The Martian, and he uh, assembled such a great cast of people who were able to bring these characters so much humanity mm. that he actually made for one of the few times in his whole career a very human, humane movie well, I'm, I'm- about very human relatable things that are actually kind of inspiring. The rest of his movies are all very cold, and all the characters are very inhuman. Look at even Blade Runner. You're not even sure if the lead character is human or not. <laughs> I think that's an exaggeration. I think there, there are films mm. that are actually very human. If it's, I would actually argue, I know you don't like it as much as I do. Yeah. I would actually argue Black Hawk Down is very human. It's about the humanity of all these people who are just basically cogs in a war machine. But once you actually mm. get down on the interpersonal level, once you're actually in the firefight, all that really matters is their humanity. And well, I actually like that movie a lot. Th- th- it values their humanity, but as humanity humans they're sort of just this big amorphous shape i feel like soldiery is one character in that movie and the various characters are just tiny elements of one gigantic personality that he's trying to sort of spread on like peanut butter across the the top of the war toast we we disagree uh, on Black I, Hawk Down. But I, I'm, I'm not a Ridley Scott fan. I should probably say I, that. I, I, I'm a huge the, fan of the movies he's done well. Like, I mm. love Alien. I love Blade Runner. I love Thelma and Louise. There's a lot of mm. really amazing movies he's done. He's also made a lot of crap and a lot of things that are just sort of, oh, uh, yeah, I saw Robin Hood. <laughs> Does anyone remember Robin Hood? Robin mm. Hood made no impact whatsoever. His Robin Hood, anyway. Really? Yeah. Like, gone. Oh, oh, yeah. Hannibal was him? You know, people, yeah. Just Hannibal? I, there's stuff I like in Hannibal. I, I like the part where Ray Liotta eats his own brain. That's good. Those that part's really, really cool. There's a bunch but, of yeah. grand guignol insanity in mm-hmm. Hannibal that I kind of admire. But in any <laughs> case, it's this... The Martian is this movie in which everything just comes together. Like, every piece mm-hmm. basically works. Now, I know that there are people who are upset about issues 
regarding the adaptation and how they took characters who were one ethnicity in the book and made them white. Nah. And that's lame. That's fucking lame. I get that. But everyone in the movie did do their job. Mm. And they did make a very good movie for what it is. Yeah. Um, and I think it's another thing, if you're going to like put it against Biodome, Biodome is kind of at its core, kind of anti-science. Mm, it yes. really just doesn't give a shit about it. Science <laughs> is the butt of its joke. Even though at the end they're like, we saved the biodome, there's no like yay science mm. aspect of it. The Martian is pro-science, and it looks at people who dedicate their lives to finding out more about the world through solving difficult problems through acquired uh, uh, knowledge and study and research and ideas and rallying together around problem solving regardless of whether or not it is easy uh-huh. that is so fucking inspiring <laughs> i loved i loved the yeah, martian yeah, it's yeah. a movie that I, I, I think if i did my top 10 list that year now it'd be way higher now than if i, I did it, it. it was on my top 10 list i that think year. it was on my top 20, 10 list, 2014 if, i think it came out and but uh, it would be way higher on my list now mm. like I, it's just only grown in my estimation over time <laughs> i i haven't had much chance to revisit it i've seen i saw bits and pieces uh, yeah. uh, recently and yeah, it really holds up. It's one of those films like, um, for me anyway, like Master and Commander. Oh, I love that. That is so m- it's so meticulous, and it moves like its meticulous elements just fit together so well, and mm. all the characters get along so well. It, it's like writing a story where the paragraphs just flow into each other, and there's no logical breaking point. Yeah. So you just kind of have to keep on going and watch it to the end. Like you're just. Oh, I, I cannot yeah. not watch Master and Commander. Hey, did you hear the the rumor that uh, they're trying to get another one off the ground? They've been trying to get one off the ground but since like, the first one. But like, but like that obviously that petered out after a while. Like, yeah. there's a brand new like Russell Crowe's trying to get it ha- make it happen. Is Peter Weir involved? I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. That'd be amazing. Please, I mean, uh, just another Aubrey Maturin story. Uh. No, and again, like the first, no big dramatic changes. It's just. A slice of life. <laughs> well, because it's a, a, it's a, older it's now, a dramatic yeah. life. Yeah, yeah, the life is dramatic. We're good. Mm. Love it. Okay, uh, so that we'll talk about Ma- for the week. We'll talk about Master and Commander a lot more over the course of this podcast because oh we God. tend to bring it up. We a love lot. it so. Uh, but uh, that that was our double feature for the week. Now next mm. week the poll is already available on Schmoville. It's already uh, picking up some votes too. Already picking up some as votes. Of this recording because uh, uh, we ended up recording this one late. I'm sorry, I got sick yesterday. It was mm. bad timing. Uh, so our carryover, our number two pick from last week was Barb Wire, starring Pamela Anderson. Mm-hmm. Um, and we decided to kind of focus on some sort of weirdo adaptations. <laughs> uh, so we got Barb Wire as one option. You can also choose Judge Dredd, the Sylvester Stallone version. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kazam, uh, starring Shaquille O'Neal as a genie. Uh, the Lawnmower Man, mm. uh, ostensibly adapted from a Stephen King story, but, but not in well, any way. In fact, Stephen King sued, sued to, to have his name, his name off taken off of and it. And he succeeded. And Van Helsing, starring Hugh Jackman, the first of many attempts Universal has had to get a shared universe of monsters on the screen. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, mm. at least one of those movies I unapologetically like. <laughs> like I genuinely like the movie. Just don't say Kazam and we'll I, be good. I will not tell you what it is. It will I will tell you if it comes up. Okay. All right. There I, you go. I as well. There's actually at least one film on that list that I'm kind of fond of. So you can go over to the Schmoville Facebook page. That poll is up right now. Uh, and whichever one wins, we will review next week, and we'll come up with a fun double feature for it. That's right. Okay. So so uh, watch The Martian and Biodome back to back. Hey, we watched it. Now they end have with to. the Martian. <laughs> Do the Martian Biodome. second. <laughs> You're gonna need it after Biodome. <laughs> Biodome is a is a harsh watch, it's, even by Polly Shore standards. Like In the Army Now is a kind movie compared to Biodome. Biodome is terrible. Biodome is pretty bad. We do also have some uh, emails to read. Okay, now you can email us. Our email is criticallyacclaimedfans at gmail dot com. Mm-hmm. We would have gone just with critically acclaimed, but it was taken. Mm -hmm. We don't assume you're fans, but we've had some very nice letters so far. And again, we don't have time to read every single one. So we're curating these a little bit more than we did in our last podcast. But we're reading a bunch of letters. Let's start reading a letter. All right. Now, this one comes from Pierre. Hi, Pierre. Hello, Pierre. Hi. Hey. Quick question for Bibbs. Okay. 
How is Okja doing on the upcoming worst movies of the year list? <laughs> is it still there? I sadistically wish you've seen enough crap in between that uh, that you had uh, time to relegate Okja to a runners-up category. Mm. In case it is still on the list, here's my modest effort to convince you that it's not bad. I'm going to take a brief interlude here for people who didn't listen to the B-Movies podcast. Mm-hmm. Neither you nor I liked Okja, no. and we're kind of the only film critics who didn't. It seems so. O- Okja is just bad. It's well, just it's, bad. I think it starts out well. If you haven't seen it, it's on Netflix. It's from uh, Bong Joon-ho, who did Snowpiercer. And it's a story of mm. a young girl who is given <clears throat> custody of a bioengineered new life form. Mm. Uh, and the whole point well, is... Spoilers. That's the first scene. No, you don't know it's bioengineered until much later. They claim that it's just a natural thing. These it's not players. hidden very well. N- nothing's hidden well in this movie. <laughs> anyway, the whole yeah. point is they have... She's going to raise this thing, mm. and she doesn't fully realize that the company's going <laughs> to want it back, and they're going to want to turn it into food. Mm. Now, there's a story there, sort of old yellowish kind of tragedy story about a child and her pet, and there's a bunch of horrible things happen to it, and there's government corruption. It's got an E.T. bit there. And then about halfway through, it is a catastrophe of tone. Mm. They do some really horrible things that they did not need to do that actually don't make any sense within the narrative and it all kind of concludes in a weird over the top plot point at like a rally so yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's ostensibly a satire of the meat industry but the things that actually go on in the meat industry are thousands of times more terrifying than the weird overblown satire they're trying to present to and you in some Alk of Jaw. the things that they show us to horrify us are literally not things that happen in the meat industry no, so it's no, so they're even that stuff up, even the, yeah. it doesn't work as the thing mm. it's trying to be that's my argument but mm. i will hear your counter argument right, right now he says I, I for sure uh it I for sure won't make you magically love the movie, but maybe you'll see that it's not that terrible. Disclaimer, I'm a big, big fan of Bong Joon-ho, but I also argue that Okja is his weakest film yet. I'm not claiming that it's a masterpiece, and it won't crack my personal 2017 list. So, and there are spoilers here. Okay, so spoiler alert, go Mm. ahead a couple of minutes if you're gonna, uh, uh, if you haven't seen it yet and you really want to. Uh, Most of your criticism I haven't much to say about, but your anger at the movie seems predominantly focused on one particular scene toward the end that I think you misinterpreted. Hmm. There's a parade on the street where Okja is exhibited. The Animal Liberation Front hijacks the ceremony and manages to screen a video to the public showing what really happens behind the curtains at the Mirando Corporation. You then say that the audience does a complete 180 and starts yelling at Tilda Swinton. Now they're convinced of her evilness, which, yes, would be completely incoherent and an ill-advised and sloppy attempt at a happy ending. The Animal Liberation Front has finally been heard, but that's not what happened. The people you see rioting are not civilians turned protesters in a span of five seconds. They are all members of the ALF and were planted in the audience. All of this was part of the hijacking. You see it clearly if you happen to watch it again. They're recognizable by their balaclavas and they start wearing that they all start wearing at the same time why would regular citizens suddenly start wearing masks all of a sudden moreover the very following scene at the slaughterhouse is a clear indication that all of this was in vain the Miranda corporation goes on with its business no national eye-opening moments no epiphany nothing the alf accomplishes nothing it's not a happy ending by any stretch of the imagination those are my two cents i wish you two good luck on your youtube journey i'll definitely annoy you again with some more letters bye for now pierre all right. Uh, okay, so listen, <clears throat> about that climactic sequence, yeah. let's deal with that first. Um, I see what you're getting at, but mm. I also think that doesn't really make sense either, because if the whole idea was to expose their corruption, filling the audience with people who already knew about it is makes it even mm. kind of more meaningless to me. They're not really going like to... Nobody's actually lines. there to get on, on the energy, it's just be for the cameras at yeah. that point. And, and as a result, I think this, it's just one of the many things that doesn't really work about it, and honestly feels kind of trashy. There is a scene... Of, and I kind of didn't want to get into this, but now we're talking about spoilers, mm-hmm. so I'm going to let it go. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say it now. I didn't want to okay. get into it in too much detail before. But there's a scene that me, my wife, you were, mm-hmm. I think, very, very injured by, which is a scene of unnecessary sexual violence used for T- very cheap toward, dramatic Toward fun. Okja, the, the, the animal. Yeah, it's completely out of nowhere. It makes no sense. <laughs> it's horrifying. It, it's uh, uh, but also it's supposed to like expose this part of the industry mm. that isn't actually what they do that they inseminate usually using tools. Yeah, but like, and 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 it, without violence because you don't want to injure the yeah, livestock. Yeah. It makes it's it's this weird moment that is so shocking and horrifying and completely atonal with like the very sweet they're, yeah, they're ET try, type story they were to, telling before that. They're trying to make imagine Free Willy or Air Bud or something uh-huh. where the animal is just violently assaulted partway. Through. 
trail. It's not. It's it's it's, it's, it's no, a. I think it's no, a huge it's, mistake, and it's completely unnecessary to tell the story that they're trying to tell. Yeah, yeah. Also, the very ending of it. There's this whole thing about how like okay, things don't work out, but we were able to solve this one thing. That doesn't work either oh. because it's all about giving away intellectual property. I don't like Okja. Yeah. I know a lot of people like Okja. They see things in it. I don't. Mm. Um, and that's that. Spoiler alert! Spoilers ending! Spoilers ending! No more spoilers. <laughs> Let's go to another letter. All right. Here's one from Joshua. Hey, Bibbs and Whitney. Love the show. The schmoes should be very proud to have you guys. Oh, that's nice. Oh, thank thank you. you. I saw Christine 2016 ah. recently and was shocked that it wasn't nominated for any awards at the Oscars. Great movie. Great performance by the lead actress. The Place Beyond the Pines was also ignored by the Oscars and was my favorite movies of the last five years. So my question is this. Are there any movies from the last five years that you think should have been nominated for Oscars but weren't? Thank you, guys. Oh, uh, I mean, yeah. Oh, golly. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm uh, trying to think. Well, okay. Um, like, completely snubbed, and i got to get this off the top of my head well, and not be wrong about it. There are a it. lot of, like, little, tiny, wonderful, completely bonkers art films that just mm. aren't ever recognized by the Academy. Just right. That's not the kind of film the Academy sees. Yeah. A lot of people saw the documentary Jodorowsky's Dune. About how Alejandro Jodorowsky oh, yeah. tried to make uh, an adaptation of Frank Herbert's Dune uh, back in the '70s, and it was go- it was going to be this big, like one of the most ambitious science fiction films to date. And mm. Pink Floyd was going to do the soundtrack. And people and, were using this documentary as <clears throat> this rallying cry about how great Alejandro, Alejandro Jodorowsky was. Meanwhile, that same this, year, that same year, uh, like only maybe a month later, he made a film, released it, and he it was one of the best films in of the year. It was called The Dance of Reality. It played in art houses for several weeks. Um, it was. It's great. It's, it's brilliant. Really one of the best films maybe of even the decade. And there and a sequel came out this year which is equally brilliant. Nobody's talking about these movies. No one Nobody saw, saw them. Alejandro Jodorowsky is an important filmmaker. He's a notable filmmaker. Yeah. And he's still making great art in his 80s that has not lost any of its color, wit or energy. And that's not the kind of film the Academy's interested in. They're not going to find this you know, weird Chilean filmmaker who does these weird, bonker, phantasmagoria films. You know, it's important to remember that the Oscars are nice and all, mm-hmm. but they're they're inherently limited. They're only limited, you know, only so many, like, nominations they can have per category. So if it's a good year for a category, it, you know, yeah, yeah. there's always going to be stuff that's left out. It's also uh, boils down to, on some level, a matter of taste. Um, tr- I recommend not getting too worked up about the Oscars. If they snub Don't. something, fine. <laughs> it's our responsibility to keep talking about it. What really, really matters is, do these films live on? Do we keep mm. telling people to watch them? Do we keep applying the lessons that they espouse in our own lives? Do we reference them in our own work or in our conversations? Ta- this is what matters. This is what time, keeps movies time, alive. Time is the ultimate arbiter. Yeah, time is the only film critic that matters. I've argued this mm-hmm. on oh. many an occasion. Um, and they, listen, there's a ton. There's even, a ton of brilliant movies that I love so, that we've totally nominated for a bunch of stuff. Um, that I am mad that they didn't get more attention in the mm-hmm. year that they came out. Um, here's here's one example. Uh, there's a God. Is it Norwegian? There's a film called Blind. Uh, came out a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. It is about a young woman who uh, is recently blinded. She only just recently lost her eyesight. Mm-hmm. And it's at the point, it's told from her perspective, visually, through what she thinks is happening around her. But she's starting to lose detail. She doesn't remember exactly what her apartment looks like. And it changes mm-hmm. from scene to scene based on her mood. Or she starts imagining that when her husband says he's going to work, he's actually just closing the door and staying inside and watching her and mm-hmm. how this affects how she is living her life. Or she starts telling a story about how he might end up having an affair because she's growing emotionally distant, but she doesn't know with whom or where it's taking place. And so, so the scenes every, change dramatically. Every time she enters a room, she sees, like, in her mind's eye, her husband is having an affair right there in the room it's one of the most <clears throat> visually ambitious without being hyper production design without mm. being like Blade Runner uh, films I've seen in a really really long time it is a fascinating character it's a fascinating perspective that we don't really see a lot it was absolutely incredible and nobody saw it and mm. it sure as hell didn't get any Oscar nominations <laughs> um, so there's a ton and if you watch a lot of movies even if you don't watch a lot of movies there's bound to be something you really really liked that gets snubbed Mm. It's lame, and we make lists well, of it to sort of remind people that just because it didn't get got just because it got snubbed doesn't mean you shouldn't see it. But try not to be too yeah. concerned because some of the best movies ever made didn't get any Oscar nominations, and we still talk about them because they're good, not because of the Oscars. Mm. 
Uh, this is also your annual reminder that the Oscars are no arbiter of actual quality. <laughs> the, no, no, the not film, the, film way, that, yeah. the film that is listed as best picture is not the best picture. Uh, last year. Uh, pardon? Last year, Moonlight. I would no. actually argue Moonlight was actually... So, that was my number one for once. So, sometimes it falls into place. Mm-hmm. The Artist is not one of the best pictures No, usually year. not. But Shakespeare I would, in Love is not one of the best uh, pictures My point is that made. every once in a while, uh, they'll actually like, oh, Bridge in the River Kwai? Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. Okay, yeah. Touche. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you got that one. All right, uh, well, well done. What, Gladiator? Really? Seriously? Yeah. Gladiator? Yeah. That's what you think is great this year? There are some years where, like... Gladiator's not good. Speaking of bad Ridley Scott movies. There's there's certain years where, like, all of the Oscar nominees are not the movies that we remember from that year. Like, like, Mm. 1999. Uh When films like... Which one of the best years for cinema ever? Ever and the nominees were shit like the cider house rules, yeah, the and green mile, and you're it's just like, like mm, I mean, they're okay, they're not the Matrix, they're not like yeah. Run Lolo Run, they're not like fucking Fight Club, they're Amer- not American like, Beauty is usually listed in there, and that ended up winning Best Picture. Yeah, Although, I, I it's, it's date, dated like crazy. Oh, there's a lot of things that don't work about it, and uh, there's a lot of things that do work about it. I'm actually mm-hmm. not going to decry everything about it, but like. Yeah, that's 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 another one where I feel like if we did that today, I don't think that would win. I, I'm not even sure to be nominated. Well, well and also be tough to watch because of the lead actor. These yeah, days, but, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So don't don't put too much stake in what the Oscars do and do not do. What you need to do is find the good film, and you need to start spreading the gospel yeah. of that film. You know, you need to start saying no, no. The dance of reality is great. This is why people become film critics is because we're trying to share the yeah. things that we love. That's it. That's mm. that's the reason. Or should be the reason anyway, if you ask me. Mm. But that's a well, yeah. neither here nor there. Let's do one or two uh, more. Uh, this one is from Hayden. It okay. says, "Hello, could you ever do a filmmaker profile, please? David Lynch, Spielberg, or Bergman?" Uh, that's a great idea. Mm. Um, I've, Scott Mance had a podcast like that. Um, I don't think he does anymore. If he mm. did, I definitely wouldn't want to step on his toes. No. Um, but I'm pretty sure you can still get old episodes of it. So you might want to check that out mm-hmm. um but yeah that sounds fun we could do that someday we, we could do that i mean you and i have filmmakers we're fond of that we've seen their entire film oh, yeah. of already oh absolutely um, like it would be pretty easy for someone like I, there, i'd have to catch up with like a couple of his david lynch's more esoteric films like industrial mm-hmm. symphony but yeah. like well, which is a stage performance really but, but yeah. still it's out there like yeah i would need to track it down mm-hmm. um but that's that's one we could do mm-hmm. for example um, I would only want to do it if we'd literally seen everything they'd done. Like, already. Or, like, or, maybe or, one or two. Well, like, it would, it, it's, it's a project. We're not going to do Hitchcock because he directed, I think, 103 films. Well, if you especially um, go down to the silent era, I mean, he did yeah. a ton, you know. Or, like, but or Miike, who's done 100 movies. Literally yeah. 100 movies. So there's there's no way. But that could be fun. We'll, we'll certainly mm. keep it in mind. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for, the, for the suggestion. It's cool. Uh, here's a letter from Matt. Hi. Yeah. Hey, guys. The show is great. Oh, thank you. You're really great. Nice. No, you're the, you're, you're the, great. You're no, the star. No, you are. No, you are. <laughs> no, you are. Specifically, uh, specifically him. Yeah. The show is great. I picked mm-hmm. up the both of you a few months ago. I'm totally. He picked he picked up on the both of you a few months months ago, and I'm totally in. He picked us up. I'm, I'm, that was you in that bar. <laughs> uh, I had a quick question for you. Yeah. Uh, for the gents out there, any movies you recommend for a date night? Romantic comedies can be tough. I'm a big fan of Michael Showalter. Yes, the big sick, but the Baxter is one of my favorites. Thanks for what you do and I'll keep on listening Matt okay, uh, well um, it depends on what kind of person your date is uh, that's the issue here I think there's this uh, idea that romantic comedies are date movies and not romantic comedies are not date movies and I think that's uh, a bit narrow and uh, granted a lot of people like romantic comedies I like romantic comedies I recommended The Mistletoe in today like <laughs> I love romantic comedies a good romantic comedy is just is delightful and charming and life affirming and mm. makes you think that the world might actually be possible to be healed it can be great however not everyone I've ever dated liked romantic comedies mm. it's important to just here's what you do if you want to show like, what should you watch what kind of movies you like oh uh-huh. Ask that, and then focus mm. on that. A lot of people like horror movies. Horror movies can be really, really great for a date night experience because they're very interactive. You know, you're jumping, mm. you're, you're like getting shivers or whatever. Or even if they're bad, you're laughing. Yeah. You know, like there's that's a great opportunity as well, provided of course that your date likes horror movies. Your date might like action movies, and this might be a good time to whip out Mad Max Fury Road again because <laughs> any excuse to whip out Mad Max Fury Road is great. Your date might like animation. <clears throat> Watch a Hayao Miyazaki film. There's a lot of great, you know. Yeah, yeah. Films in uh, that ilk is is that now is there a universal date movie? No, uh, no. 
Definitely not. Uh, but Don Juan DeMarco will come close. <laughs> no, Don Juan DeMarco is pretty terrible, actually. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty it's a terrible. weird pick for all the well, things we need to pluck I, out of the air. I, I remember seeing, uh, a, like, they actually printed this in the newspaper ads for Don Juan DeMarco. They said, if you can't get laid after watching this movie, Shut up. you can't get laid. You're making that up. I'm not making that That's up. That was horrible. in the newspaper ad. That some, is horrible. Some critic said that, so they quoted them. Oh, Probably God. Peter Travers. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at you, Travers. <laughs> Mr. Quoted in everything. <laughs> so so for a while, it was kind of a joke for us for the longest time that yeah. Don Juan DeMarco was like the <laughs> ultimate date movie because if you couldn't get laid after watching Don Juan DeMarco, you couldn't get laid. Uh, the more the thing I'm actually more interested in is, mm-hmm. and they actually they did a gag about it in The Big Sick, which is the sort of the litmus test movie. You, you show you, you sh- show them one of your favorite movies, and if they like it, it's you okay to keep c- continue socializing. And if they don't like it, you're yeah. done. <laughs> and I think maybe you could, if you want to come up with an idea, maybe you each do one of those movies, mm. like do a double feature, yeah, like whatever yeah. movie is like so important to you, and you really want them to connect to this, and you just do them both. Mm. That actually might be a, a fun idea for uh, for a date. But yeah, this isn't like I, I wish there, if there was a list of just movies everyone will like and will make them feel romantic. Mm. We wouldn't need other lists. <laughs> we just watch those movies over and over again because they'd make they'd us be, happy. Be it doesn't work in that stone. way. Um, <clears throat> when we can recommend a bunch of romantic movies to you, but it sounds like you're trying to eke out of the romantic comedy section. So yeah, just mm. ask what your date likes, and then maybe you try to come you up with what? a movie they haven't seen in that genre. That might be kind of fun. You Challenge want something yourself. That's, that's romantic. Kind of sexy, a little bit edgy, shows that you have a little bit of art school cred. Watch the movie Short Bus with your date. Okay, I was, okay. Yeah. All right. They got real sex on camera, but it's also really, it has a big heart. It's it's really really kind of emotional and disarming in a a Mm -hmm. sort of a way. It's also, I think, NC-17, so gauge your audience. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, gauge your audience. Like I said, there's real sex on camera. I'm just saying, like, you know, this is not like... Depending on who it is, it might not be first date material. Or I suppose it might not, not. You know, like think about these yeah. things. Um, I, again, depends who your date is. I suppose that's true. Yeah. Okay, what's our what, yeah. what's our? I hope we hope that helps. I know that's kind yeah. of throwing the ball back in your court, yeah. but hopefully we can give you a frame of mind to, to right. work with. This one comes from Luis. Hello, okay. Luis. Um, hello, Whitney. Oh, he says that his the English is not so good in this letter. So, oh, I'm sure it's fine. Yeah, but don't worry, sure about it's fine. Hello, Whitney and Biz. My name is Luis. I'm a Brazilian designer. I love your shows and especially the way you address every mail with such care. Oh, thank mm, you. Thank you. I've always been the film guy in my group. Watched every movie and TV show. It was always on the top of everything movie related. Although I prefer the mainstream cinema to the art movies, I used to watch all kinds of films. I'm especially into horror and stuff made with no budget and a lot of love, like Evil Dead or the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Good movies. But then I started dating this girl who worked as a screen screenwriter and i got a little involved in the process uh helped write some tv episodes even went to set a few times on some small productions it was super cool cool but since we brought up i just don't feel it anymore you it's broke all up? broke up sorry since we yeah. broke up i just don't feel it anymore it's way too much connected to her now so i want some help could you maybe recommend some movies that you think could reignite my love for movies thanks in advance keep doing the good work you know there's a there's a similar <clears throat> thing uh, I, I, I think happens mm. when you just go to film school or you start getting involved in the industry where you start seeing the nuts and bolts of it mm. and movies can sometimes start feeling like work mm. or they can uh, whatever or, but, but I think this is a little bit of that and I think it's a little bit of just bad memories mm. of, of relationship and that sucks I, my advice my first and I'm curious what you what you think but my advice would be to start seeking out movies that you were never interested in before if there's a genre you're not terribly familiar with or particularly cared for, try watching that. That'll be new and different yeah, and yeah. won't carry as much baggage and you won't be quite as mm. hyper aware of it. Yeah. Um, when you're in a relationship and you're introduced to a lot of new interesting art by the person you're dating and then you have a bad breakup, that art is forever going to be associated with that person in your mind. But uh, not necessarily. Yeah, no, yeah, not um, necessarily. The art they introduce you to is something they might like. What you have to do is train yourself not to s- ask yourself, would they have liked this? What would they think of it? Mm. It's not their job anymore. Yeah. It's now your job to figure out if you like this. Yeah. And that's actually a much more exciting question to ask yourself. Um, if you are finding your passion for cinema flagging, and it happens to all of us. Sure. Um, 
I would say go back to the beginning. Mm. Find some of the films of the Lumiere brothers. Go back to when the camera was first invented. Try to see how everything started, where all of the passion really stemmed from. Because everybody has the same flashpoint. Cinema started at a, a finite point. You know, there's actually, I'm going to recommend right there, uh, mm. two, well, two things, actually. I have a slightly different uh, mm. suggestion, but along those lines, there's a great documentary called Lumiere and Company. Yeah, yeah. Which is really, really great, because it's all about the first cameras, <clears throat> and it's all about getting a bunch of contemporary filmmakers, people like David Lynch mm. or uh, Neil Jordan, and uh, getting p- them to make a film using the original camera. Mm. And it's that passion, that sort of fascination with old cinema, how much people love the history of it. I think that might be a little infectious. The other thing, and I thought this is where you're going to go with this, when you say go back to the beginning. Mm. Um, you can go back to the beginning of cinema itself. You can also go back to the beginning of your love with cinema. And you can look at films uh, that don't have baggage that is other, other people connected to it. It's just you. Mm. What are the films that you used to watch when you were a kid? Mm. What are the films that you watched uh, with your parents as opposed to uh, your ex-girlfriend, mm. boyfriend? Doesn't matter. Like, whatever. Go back to your earliest love of it and try to just think of the first time you saw it. Mm. And that might also uh, help as well. The other thing I'm going to say, and this might sound like sacrilege, it's also okay if you take a break from being super <laughs> passionate about something for a little while. It is okay. I know we define ourselves a lot by the stuff we love, and that's natural. I get it. But it can be really useful to take a step back once in a while. Maybe this would be a good opportunity for you to pick up like another hobby or something for a little bit. Mm. Maybe like look into something you don't normally do, like uh, I don't know, Cooking. working with your hands. Yeah. <laughs> Cooking is a good example. Working with your hands. Um, I've been I've been meaning to take up needlepoint for a while. That's one hundred percent true. It just gives me something to do with my hands, mm. and at the end I have something to show for it, right. which is kind of cool. Because usually when I when I play around with like little fidget spinners or whatever like that, mm. it's not productive. It's just keeping <laughs> it's my like for it's just today, keeping yeah. me from being idle um so that can be an opportunity to do film is alive and life is complicated and sometimes very difficult and it's okay if your relationship with cinema is a lot like your relationship with anyone else has some ups and downs yeah, and you, so yeah you said you like horror movies and mainstream stuff not so much the art stuff why not try some art stuff why not the art stuff mix it up you might find something really amazing in if it. if your ex was a screenwriter they're probably really concerned with structure and screenwriting tropes and a lot of that art cinema deliberately gets rid of all that crap yeah so like try it actively challenges yeah. it in a lot of different ways watch eraser head there you go say. really mess with you <laughs> actually that's, that might be a little too intense right now yeah, well, <laughs> that's, nope. that's about that's also about some bad breakup stuff no, i don't that, know if that's i don't know if i recommend that one never right now. never too intense for eraser head okay, eraser head is always I, great. i'm 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 going to mount a minor objection to that. So we have, take that advice with a grain of salt. We have one final letter. Let's do one like, more letter. Right, and, uh, we're, and we're kind of... And we're, and we're caught up. Pretty much that. caught up. So this one comes from Hay- Hayden. Yeah. Hello, Hayden. Hello. Since we all know Justice League was essentially directed by two people, Zack Snyder and Joss Whedon, yep. many have been asking to see the Snyder version of the film. There's even an online... P- Petition, really? There is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as someone who disliked Justice League, I don't think a pure Snyder cut would make it a whole lot better. It could would be more tonally consistent, but it would also have many of the Snyder traits that bring down a lot of his films. Some of them being his overbearing sense of importance and his poor storytelling. The other question is... Is this supposed to be? Is does the supposed Snyder cut even exist? There's a good chance that there might be an assembly cut, but I doubt this version got any much further than that. What are your guys' thoughts? Uh, a couple of things with that. Uh, mm. I'm, I'm not. I'm actually going to step away from whether or not it would be good. That's a matter of mm. perspective. It's a matter of opinion. Some people are bigger fans of Zack Snyder than you or I are. I like mm. some of his films. I don't like some of his others. I, and, and both I'm, of us kind of like Justice. We, we League. We also like Justice League. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's a not... mess, but it ended up being rather <clears throat> enjoyable. Um, when it comes down to the director's cut. I don't know if it'll be good. Maybe it would be good. The problem is, it probably doesn't exist, at least not in the way anyone thinks. When we think of a director's cut, we think the director cut the film, made the film that they wanted, Mm. and then it got taken away from them. This has happened quite a bit. It happened to Ridley Scott a couple of times, for example. Um, In the case of Justice uh, Justice League, it's my understanding... I I understand one thing. I'm not 100% sure about all the details, and there's one thing I know for certain. But it's my understanding that the the quibbling and the changing of Zack Snyder's vision happened during production. Okay. He didn't just get to make his movie and then they changed it. Mm. I know they cut out a lot of stuff. That's that's 100% true because you see it in all the trailers, a bunch of scenes that don't exist in the movie. But he was already being messed with on a, yeah, on a studio yeah. level early on. The other issue is that even if you could cobble together all of Zack Snyder's material... Mm. Uh, they would have to finish the film. 
And that requires many millions of dollars of visual effects. We're talking tens <laughs> of millions of dollars, maybe more. Mm. Of, we're talking visual effects sequences, cleaning up compositing, filling out green screens. Mm. You also have to do all the new sound design. You're going to have to completely rescore it. You're going to have to... It, it requires basically doing an entirely new post-production process, and that's insanely expensive right now. And the movie isn't making enough to justify making an entirely new movie out of it just to be released on home video. Yeah. It's just not the the, it, the audience just isn't there. The this notion that Zack Snyder would have somehow saved this movie that people widely t- seem to dislike uh, is is just a churlish notion. Uh, yeah. li- li- like you, I see, think it's I think it's optimistic. It, it's it's optimistic that somehow if Zack Snyder had been allowed to finish what he would, that it would have been saved somehow. That yeah. that it was completely ruined by Joss Whedon coming in and, and tinkering with it. Yeah. Uh, As we said in our review, this is the one that actually feels the most tonally consistent of the whole series so far. Wonder Woman notwithstanding. Wonder Wonder Woman's the other one. Wonder Woman's the other one. Yeah. Uh, Despite that horrible climax that undercuts a lot of the the point of the movie. There's like two things uh, in Wonder Woman that I don't think work, and they both feel like studio notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The climax is one of them, I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. But... yeah, I don't think bringing in Snyder, I think bringing Snyder back in might have actually hampered the production, but I couldn't say for sure. We can't. It's I, frustrating I that we o- don't know. I'll I give you only, that. I can only criticize what has been given us. And you might be able to see the seams in this movie. You might be able to see what is Whedon and what is Snyder. Mm-hmm. And you might be a little bit frustrated that you're not getting whole one or the, one or the other. All you have now is this mutant hybrid between the two of them. And that's... You can't put that in a centrifuge anymore. You can no longer separate them. Well, what you have is this blend. Yeah. And you got to drink it and say this is how this blend tastes. Well, you look at like you look at like the Richard Donner cut of mm. Superman 2, which I would actually argue is better than the theatrical cut I, of Superman 2. It two. actually is. It's also a mess because he had to use material that he wasn't responsible for, that he didn't shoot. Mm. He had to reuse the ending because they weren't going to be able to film a new one because that was never his original intended ending. Uh there's a lot of things that are a mess with it. We may see a lot of deleted scenes someday. I'll bet we do. Yeah. I think it'd be foolish not to release those in some respect. At least, if not right away, then in like a special edition down the road. You're going to see some of this material. Mm. But getting it all edited together and getting Zack Snyder's complete creative vision back, I, I, don't, I think that's a fantasy. Mm. I think... It's a nice fantasy, and you might want to think about it. There's a lot of like films that I never got to see the real version of because footage was lost. Look at like the real ending of the Magnificent Ambersons yeah, is gone yeah. forever, as far as we know. It sounds like it was burned. Uh, the Spider Pit sequence in King Kong is gone. London After Midnight is a lost film. <laughs> There's a ton of lost cinema. This isn't quite that, but it is probably we're never going to see Zack Snyder's pure version of this. Mm. If I were Warner Brothers and I wanted to show people Zack Snyder's vision of it someday, what I would do mm. is I would put together like a book of his storyboards. What, um, like clean up the storyboards, do the comic book version right. of it maybe. That might be fascinating to watch. What I would do is just wait for Justice League Part 2, which no doubt is coming. I uh, or doubt. I guess, I guess, I guess well, maybe right not. I, th- I think the series is starting to, to dissipate after this, which yeah. I'm fine with. I, I got what I needed. But... Uh, <laughs> I, th- I, I don't need any more of any of these characters. I I'm think there's fine. life in these characters. I know they're already making Aquaman, so they're definitely going to cut oh, okay. that one out. And maybe if Aquaman is great, maybe mm. we can move on, and we can yeah, just sort I of think... we can just sort of say like, "Hey, we screwed up on this one. We're just going to move on after that." <laughs> I wish we'd done that with Spider-Man. Honestly, like yeah. Spider-Man Three, I, I know I like it more than most people. I also know it's not really that good, but like certainly there are things that suck. But did it do anything worse than like Moonraker did in James Bond? <laughs> Just make another James Bond after that. Just say, okay, the third one was kind of lame, but now we're back. Well, and we're doing the Vulture or something, and it's cool. You could have been fine. I don't know why I had to reboot it after that. The brand wasn't yeah, ruined. The, the problem is they're thinking of it in terms of the brand and not just uh, m- making a movie. Yeah. Anyway. So, yeah, the, the brand is ruined. What we got was Justice League. I'm okay with that. It's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pretty zen I don't, I don't have so much in these movies that I need to see another Justice League or Zack Snyder's pure version of it. I'm just... I'm, well, but on the other hand, if it, you do, I job. get it. And besides, I just think it's, it's an uphill battle. I don't think it's going to come to fruition the way you want it it's to. It's our job as critics to judge what's on the screen and not necessarily... The unmade version that could we, have been. We got to try to meet these things at their own level. No, Justice League is a Frankenstein monster. Mm. I have a lot of affection for the Frankenstein monster. <laughs> there you go. Mm. Um, so that's uh, that's that's our show. 
Again, you can uh, send us some more emails. Send us more questions, yeah, concerns, do. debate topics. Um, we're at critically acclaimed fans at gmail.com. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter at William Bibiani. I'm at Whitney Seibold. That's Whitney with no H and Seibold with an EI. He knows it's weird. What can he do? It's on his birth certificate. It's Cut him some a, slack. A German Welsh first name and German last name. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be back next week with reviews of a bunch of new movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I actually <laughs> forgot to look up. We, we have I, Tanya coming I, up Tanya is definitely coming yeah. up next week, and that, that'll be fun. Uh, mm. And a couple others as well. Yeah. No yeah. doubt. <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure it out. I didn't... What? What do you want from me? I was sick. Okay, moving on. Uh, and we're also going to be reviewing our, our latest double feature. Mm-hmm. You can vote right now uh, for the quote-unquote bad movie you want us to review. Again, your options are on the Schmoville Facebook page, Barb Wire, Judge Dredd, Kazam, The Lawnmower Man, and Van Helsing. So thank you, everybody, for listening. And never forget, everyone's a critic. I want to go to the Midnight Show. I'm sorry, what?